Hello, everyone. Okay, I think this is working. So I've yet again changed my audio setup. It seems a little loud. Let's see if this works. Okay, so we'll use that for a little bit. I've changed my audio setup a little bit to allow myself to uh, talk into the microphone when I'm wearing the VR headset. When I was using it yesterday, I had the microphone off to the left, and so anytime I turn my head to the right, uh, audio dropped quite a bit. So hopefully that keeps that a little bit louder. Uh, it sounds like you could still hear me throughout, so that's good, um, but I'm hoping today it'll be a little bit more clear uh, at the risk that it might be a little bit of a hot mic. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully if the audio gets to be obnoxiously loud, um, shoot me a message in the chat or just give me a heads up and I'll see what I can do about it. All right, a couple of pieces of background information. So kind of the normal opening spiel here. Um, hi, welcome, happy Wednesday. So this is a series of lessons going through the private pilot syllabus. So this is all of the topics that you would learn if you were working with a CFI for your initial uh, pilot's license, uh, for a private pilot's license. The intent with these is to cover all of the topics as though you were going through that um, training process, um, but it's important to keep in mind that the best way and really the only way to learn to fly is with a CFI that you work one-on-one -on -one with to develop those skills. Um, so I hope that you find these uh, lessons useful and informative, uh, maybe improve your sim flying, maybe improve your real world flying if you're already a pilot. Uh, but the goal here is not to provide that, uh, that CFI type instruction like you would get working in real life with a CFI. Instead, it's um, to hopefully walk through some of these topics and, and answer any questions that folks have. If you are interested in learning to fly, and I hope that you are, the best thing to do is to go to your local airport and either find a CFI there or a flight school or a flying club and they'll be able to point you in the right direction for how to get started. Almost always you'll start with a demo flight which is just going up for 30 minutes to an hour and uh, getting to try out flying the airplane and see if you like it. Uh, that's how I started flying, that's how most of the people I know started flying and it's a really good Either uh, if you're interested, set it up for yourself or else I actually got mine as a gift for my wife. So that's another thing you could think for gifts for family members is a good one. Uh, these lessons will build on each other, just like any curriculum you might expect, but I'll be mindful of folks who are joining for just this lesson. So hopefully you'll still be able to pull out some useful pieces of information, even if you are only able to tune in periodically. The uh, questions that you have during the live stream, feel free to ask in Twitch, that's wonderful. Um, if you have any questions after the fact, you can use um, Discord. Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Oh no, now that I said it, it's not happening. Okay, well, I muted my mic, but we'll see, maybe I, I might need to sneeze in a moment. Oh, hey, I'll go, good to see you. Hello, hello. Uh, but if you have questions after the fact, the best place to ask is in the Discord. Um, and if you want to see any of the old videos, you can see them out on YouTube. I'm also always open to feedback, so if you have any thoughts or ways to improve, um, especially as I'm starting to do this sort of using VR to work through some of these lessons, um, there's not a lot of good resources I can find online for good tips and tricks. So feedback from all of you tuning in is, is really, really helpful. Um, audio is a good example. So this is one of the things from yesterday uh, to work on. Uh, last two things I'll mention real quick, just as we're opening up here. Um, I'm still kind of working through different uh, odds and ends bugs. I see that we have a couple of dropped frames at the beginning here, um, just from my live streaming setup. It looks like that's stabilized out, and so hopefully we're in a better shape than we were maybe two weeks back. Um, but again, if you see anything, uh, definitely call it out. Always helpful to know. And the last thing I'll mention, and I'll try and remember to say this also when I actually flip over to VR. Um, when I'm flying in VR, I can't see the uh, Twitch chat at all. So I'll try and take some pauses where I go and look and read through any questions that popped up while we were flying. Um, but just a heads up that I won't, um, I won't know until afterwards and apologies in advance if there's some horrendous audio problem or something like that going on. 
Two pieces of follow-up from the last slide I wanted to call out. Um, one question that came up was the proper distance to um, to maintain from the runway uh, to the downwind. So in that traffic pattern we were looking at, actually, I can pull this up. Okay, here we go. Um, one thing that uh, will come up a little bit, but this um, the way that I stream my iPad to the computer is sort of changing resolution. So if it suddenly jumps to smaller again, I'll try and be watching for it, but um, I still haven't quite figured out what it is that causes that. Uh, okay, but if I go to yesterday, we talked about the traffic pattern and we talked about the named leg. So there's this downwind leg. And one of the questions that we were talking about is how far away should you be from the runway to the downwind leg? And so the official answer slash, well, answer suggestion you could say for it is somewhere between a half mile and a mile away. Um, so if you were at the lesson yesterday, uh, you might remember that I was flying just about a half mile away. Um, today, I'm actually going to try and have a little bit more distance on away from the runway. I think try and stay a little bit more to three quarters of a mile to a mile uh, because I want to show a good, clean base leg. Um, it's important to have a clean base leg because that's what sets you up for a really good uh, final leg, that final approach into land. And of course, that sets you up for good landing. So they say that if you want a good landing, you need to first have a good approach. And a good approach starts back um, all the way at the you know, at, as you're flying through the pattern. All right, since I'm over here, I'll just leave up the lesson notes. The other one I wanted to mention, I called the Palo Alto um, threshold. So at Palo Alto, we have that kind of odd threshold. And I'll pull it up on the iPad so you can see what I'm talking about. So at Palo Alto, we have this sort of odd uh, yellow threshold here. Um, this is a relocated threshold. So in the lesson, I called it a displaced threshold. This is not a displaced threshold. This is a relocated threshold. And the big difference is that a relocated threshold, that relocation is still the yellow markings. It's still part of the taxiway. And so the start of the runway for taking off is just at the end of the yellow lines, those yellow chevrons at the end. So you would line up here before you start taking off. A displaced threshold, um, in some ways looks similar, but the big difference is that you'll see this whole area will all be white. So if I go, perhaps I can change this even to, oh, okay, a little bit too much work, but this would all be white. Um, and then that would mean that you can take off using that section. Um, so as we start to go to other airports, we'll see a couple of examples of this. Um, they're relatively common. Actually, the uncommon one is what you're seeing here. So Palo Alto with the relocated threshold is a pretty unusual um, thing to see. So. All right. Back there. Okay, great. So let's dive into today's lesson. Today we're talking about normal and crosswind approaches and landings. So the objective for today, develop knowledge, risk management, and skills associated with normal and crosswind approach and landing. References, the Airplane Flying Handbook, Chapter 9, this approaches and landings. Very good read. Um, the whole Airplane Flying Handbook and the uh, Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge are both great resources. So I highly recommend reading them in general. Um, but especially for chapters where the chapter is all about the topic we're talking about, uh, pretty Pretty good one to check out. Private Pilot ACS, the Airman Certification Standards, and then the POH, the Pilot's Operating Handbook for the book, which we're actually going to spend a little bit of time in today, similar to how we did with takeoffs. This builds on maneuvering during slow flight, power on and off stalls, normal crosswind takeoffs, and climbs. Um, oh, and of course, our flying the traffic pattern and go arounds. So if you notice, this is probably the most number of builds on previous lessons that we've looked at so far. And the reason for that is that a lot of the practice and preparation that we've been doing is for flying around the traffic pattern and for dealing with operating when, or de uh, flying the airplane safely when we're really close to the ground um, during takeoffs and during landings. 
So that maneuvering during slow flight, power on and off stalls, uh, normal crosswind takeoffs and climb, and then flying the traffic pattern and the go-arounds we talked about yesterday. Schedule for today. So I have us for 1.5 hours of ground, 1.5 hours of flight, and then of course we'll practice landings every future flight. In the real world working with a student, this is what this lesson would look like. For us today, I expect us to spend about an hour and a half on ground and then maybe an hour in flight. So I try to keep these typically to uh, two hours. So I'll try to finish at one. Um, but today, almost certainly we're gonna finish at 1.30, maybe later. Um, we have a chunk of ground stuff to cover that all then becomes really important for the practicing. And then of course you wanna go up and do a couple of actual practice rounds. So we'll see what we can do to streamline some of it. Um, but, um, but yeah, so today is, I would say, a, a high likelihood to go longer than two hours. There's no questions before we start here. I will dive into the lesson elements. So a couple of things we're going to talk about. One, I want to give kind of the overview thought process of landing, um, something that is useful just to keep in mind as we're actually practicing it. Talk about actual the landing performance and limitations, uh, all things out of the POH, similar to how we did with the takeoff performance. Other safety concerns to be aware of, things like traffic obstructions, hazards, wake turbulence. A lot of these are things that might require a go around, um, and there's a, a bunch of stuff that we're gonna cover today. The importance of a stabilized approach to landing and what it means to be a stabilized approach. And then actually flying the landing through the pattern. So this is the maybe the in practice part of things. Talk about a couple of landing issues to be aware of and you want to make sure you're avoiding and then finish with common errors. So let's start at the top with the goal of landing, this first element here. So actually, let me see if I can make that. Ah, that's okay. So the goal of landing is to smoothly transfer weight from the wings to the wheels. So if you think about it, when the aircraft is on the ground, there's this force of gravity pulling it down and the wheels, the landing gear, is supporting the weight of the airframe. During our takeoff roll, so not landings, but during takeoff roll, we're accelerating. And as we accelerate, we transfer the weight of the aircraft from the landing gear to the wings. So that smooth transfer of weight from landing gear to wings is what a takeoff is. On the flip side then, during a landing, we wanna do a smooth transfer of weight from the wings to the wheels. And we'll talk about the technique that we actually use to do that, but that transferring of weight is a really useful concept to hold in the back of your head as you're you know, holding off the airplane from landing and letting it um, very smoothly come down. One of the other things that was really helpful to me when I was first um, practicing takeoffs and landings is to think about the kind of symmetry that you see between the two. So you'll recognize when we talk about landing in a crosswind, the same way that we take off into a crosswind where we deflect our ailerons, let our downwind uh, tire come off the ground first before we then rotate and, and fly off the runway. In the same way as we're doing our side slip in for landing, you'll see that same sort of um, side slip into the wind with a wing down. We'll have one tire touchdown first and then the, the downwind tire second in a crosswind landing. So there's some nice symmetry between takeoffs and landings that's good to keep in mind or at least it's kind of a helpful mental model. Let's talk a little bit about determining landing performance and limitations. So every time we're gonna go fly, wherever we're going to fly, we wanna make sure that we have the performance necessary to uh, take off from the runway and then also land at the runway. One thing to be aware of is you need typically, not always, but typically you need less runway to land than you do to take off. So you may end up in a situation where if you are planning a, a flight to a short air or a short runway somewhere, you may be able to land in the amount of space, but you actually can't take off. Or perhaps the weather changes throughout the day. So if you remember performance degrades as you get higher in altitude, as it gets hotter out, or as you get heavier. And so if it's hot, high, and heavy, um, then you may not be able to, you may not get the same performance that you would have uh, if you had taken off maybe early morning. Um, so a really classic example of this is if you go up and fly in the mountains and you're uh, 
starting to make your way back and maybe you got delayed over lunch and so now you're flying through the heat of the day and you come into land and the runway, the airport environment is now much warmer than it would have been at like maybe 9 a.m. And so we want to, when we're thinking about performance for landing, we want to take into account the actual um, factors at the airport that we're actually going to at that time. Okay, so let's look at what that looks like in practice a little bit more. So looks like my iPad's still working, great. So first thing we're gonna do is go into the POH. Highly recommend getting a copy of the POH, something that is worth um, perusing through. Actually, an earlier lesson had part of the homework of reading through a number of sections. Um, one of them was performance, so you may already be familiar with this. Under section five, we're gonna go into the performance here. And we can see there's a bunch of performance we'll talk more about uh, when we do some cross-country planning. For today, we're interested in the short field landing distance. So we're not going to be doing a short field landing technique today. So this is a specific technique that we use to land in the shortest possible distance. Um, but this at least gives us a good reference point for what a perfectly executed short field landing would allow us to land, like what, what distance of ground roll and what distance over a 50 foot object we'd expect to be able to land in. So, okay, so first thing that we're seeing here, um, they have a bunch of conditions that they're expecting. So one is for this to, for these numbers to be correct, there's that maximum braking. Um, we, we have enough runway, you'll see when we start to do these numbers, we have enough runway that we don't need to be slamming on the brakes like that. We can let the airplane aerodynamically slow down, just sort of, um, we'll, we'll talk about how to do that, but essentially um, use the, a drag of the airframe to slow the airplane down. But if we were trying to stop in the maximum or shortest possible distance, we'd apply maximum braking. The other one that's a little different from what we're going to do is they have speed at 50 feet at 61 knots indicated airspeed. That's the short field landing speed. We're going to be practicing with 65 knots, which is a reasonable uh, airspeed to use for just a normal approach and landing when you have plenty of runway to work with. So but everything else on here is sort of the same assumptions that we'd look at, look at today. Um, okay, so now let's talk about how to read this table. We've already done this once with the takeoff and landing, I'm sorry, with the takeoff performance calculation. So it works very, very similarly. We have our pressure altitude in feet. The way that we would get the pressure altitude is by um, uh, setting our altimeter to 29.92, uh, 29.92. Um, which is the standard pressure setting. That then gives us the uh, pressure altitude for where we're gonna be flying at. Um, for instance, for today, we're setting it and I'm gonna use clear weather. Well, we could do this as an example real quick. So um, actually for time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not do that piece of it, but, uh, but we can talk about what it would mean. So, if you set your altimeter to 29.92, that gives you the pressure altitude, and that reading then is what you would use for your performance calculations here. Because we're setting the weather in the sim to be a standard day, that means the pressure will be 92.92. And so our pressure altitude, we're flying at essentially sea level, so our pressure altitude will be sea level. So we can use this first row here. The temperature outside at the airport, um, we can look at, but a standard day would be 15 degrees. That would be halfway between these two. And so we expect our ground roll to be halfway between these two numbers, which is 575. And we expect our total feet to clear a 50 foot obstacle. So if you're descending to the airport and you need to clear, for instance, trees or something on the approach end of the runway, which would be halfway between these two. So that would be 1,335. For my own personal minimums, I expect to be landing at a runway that has an additional 50% buffer on the performance that I need for over 50, uh, 50 foot obstacles. So 1335 is the, if everything goes like textbook, uh, perfect kind of landing. Um, but I like to have a little bit of buffer to make sure that I have some wiggle room so I'm not trying to stop at the very, very end of the runway. And so 1335.15, uh, um, I guess I could do a rough math on this, but let's just type it into the calculator. 1335 times 
Okay, so 2002, there you go. So I'm looking for a runway for my own um, personal minimums, a runway that is 2,000 feet long. If we go onto our Palo Alto runway, sure enough, our runway here is 2,440 feet long. I might you might remember yesterday when we were looking at the sectional, you can also get the shortest runway distance from this little info box on the sectional. It's this number right after the uh, lighting information. So that's 2,400 feet is what that means. Um, so both cases were looking good. Oops, if I want to do that. The other thing we should be looking at for this is the effect of wind and the surface that we're flying on. So just like with takeoffs, those both impact our performance. So decrease distances 10% for every nine knots of headwind. If we have tailwind, then we increase distances for 10 knots for every two knots of tailwind. So you'll notice that a headwind decreases our takeoff distance by just a little bit, but a tailwind increases it by quite a lot, right? For every nine knots, we increase by 10 versus for every two knots, we increase by 10 if it's a tailwind. Another part of the reason that we want to land into the wind. Uh, today we're flying with clear skies, so we'll have no wind. When we start to do a little bit of crosswind practice at the end, then we'll have a little bit more headwind uh, that would make our landing performance a little better. For operation on dry, on dry grass runway, increase distances by 45% of the ground roll figure. We're uh, operating on a pavement, so it doesn't affect us. And if landing with flaps up, increase the approach speed by 9 knots and allow for 35% longer distances. So we're going to be landing with full flaps, um, so we don't need to take this into account. But it's good to have that number in the back of your mind because, for instance, in the Cessna, the flaps are operated by the electrical system. So if something happened while you were flying and you lost your electrical system, the engine would still work just fine, the airplane flies just fine, but you wouldn't be able to use the flaps through the landing. And so you'd want to know what that additional landing distance you need is for a no-flap landing. Um, you notice that my personal minimum, which is that basically 50% over, um, would give me then uh, a, a, enough additional room to do a no-flap landing if I needed to. So another reason why that kind of personal minimums is something to consider. I will actually talk a lot about personal minimums when we get up to uh, solo flights. So we're going to have a ground session on kind of reviewing all of the information you need before you go flying solo. And one of those... Um, that we've been developing through these lessons is sort of thinking about whether and whether or not you should be flying on a given day. Um, but turning those into some personal minimums and understanding of uh, what limitations you want to put on your own flying. Okay, so there's one part. Let's look at the, let me put my calculator away again. So let's keep going on our lesson plan for today. So the, so I'm gonna clear this. He said here, okay, great. So a couple other safety concerns that we want to take into account, and there's several here. So if we were doing this in the real world, I would uh, probably go through about half of them and then we'll take a pause, maybe get some water, a little stretch break, and then come back to them. Um, Cause each of these are important and just barreling through them isn't super useful for learning. Um, because we're in a recorded format, I'm gonna kind of just go through each of them. And if you're, if you're watching live and it seems like a lot, I'm sorry about that. Um, if you're watching after the fact, or if you're watching live and want to revisit after the fact, um, I would encourage you to maybe take a pause if it starts to be a lot of information, and then you can come back to it and look at some of these other ones later. A couple safety concerns that we want to be cognizant of. One of them is collision avoidance. Next one, wake turbulence, wind shear avoidance, and then the use of a gust factor for a final approach speed. Let's start by talking about collision avoidance. This is gonna have the most kind of subparts to it. So collision avoidance is something that we're always cognizant of when we're flying. If you tuned in yesterday when we were doing the traffic pattern, you saw me leaning around and making sure that I'm checking for traffic uh, around the traffic pattern, looking for people who might be entering the traffic pattern, um, either from the typical kind of like 45 degree entry, or if they're just entering in a weird way, uh, doing something unexpected, 
kind of flying defensively, you could say. There's a couple of things that we do to avoid collisions. One of them is that clearing practices. So clearing turns, you know, whenever we do our maneuvers, we do two 90 degree clearing turns. Uh, you've seen those in all of the maneuvers that we've done. Another good clearing procedure is to avoid descending into the traffic pattern. So if you're flying the traffic pattern and you start descending down, it may be that there's a plane directly below you you can't see that you could be descending into. Um, so this is something you generally want to avoid. There's several other good clearing procedures, um, clearing procedure suggestions in the PHAC chapter 14. I would recommend giving those uh, a look over because they're, um, they're a good set of all the different things that would be places in your flying where you may not have thought uh, about the fact that you can't see super well. A good example of this would be if you're climbing up, um, doing some gentle banks back and forth to try and see uh, down below the plane or to see in places where the wings may be blocking your view, depending on the type of plane you're flying. Uh, but there's several more in here that are really good. So that's clearing procedures. The next one is scanning for traffic. So we talk about scanning. Um, when we've talked about scanning in the past, we talk about scanning in kind of 10 degree increments at a time. We're trying to use that uh, motion that our eyes are so good at detecting, right? So human vision is really good at detecting motion, but in order to detect motion, your eyes have to be focused at a stationary area long enough to see the motion happen. So if you're continuously just moving your head back and forth, then your eyes are continuously in motion and you can't actually pick up any relative motion. Instead, what we do is we look for 10 degree segments of the sky at a time, and we're scanning and we're looking at that uh, segment for 10, uh, for a couple seconds and looking for any motion there and then moving on to the next 10 degree segment. Um, you'll actually see me doing that when we go fly in VR. It's, um, it's sort of this like look and pause, look and pause, look and pause uh, kind of motion. Another one that you'll see a lot of, especially because we're flying in the pattern, is looking for key points in the pattern where traffic is likely to be. So one is if they're entering on the 45, it's a very likely place they would be. Um, also, as you're turning each of the different uh, onto each of the new legs of the pattern, you want to make sure you're looking under your wing like we always do and looking around you to see if there's anyone coming in from weird angles. Um, there's the expected traffic that, you know, like for instance, as you're turning from base to final, there's a reasonable chance that someone is coming in on a long straight in. And so you're definitely checking um, over, your, over your left shoulder, well, over the outside shoulder, looking for any traffic on a straight end. Uh, but then there's also the chance that you'd have just traffic coming in at uh, a weird angle because someone's doing something that they really shouldn't be. Um, we want predictability in the pattern, but we also should be defensive when we're, we're flying around. Another piece of this that's really important for collision avoidance is right-of-way rules. So if you've ever done, um, obviously in driving, we have right-of-way rules. If you've ever gone boating, we have right-of-way rules. And the right-of-way rules are a little different in the aircraft because we have this three-dimensional space that we have to deal with. This is also going to be our first time really getting into the FARs. Um, these are the Federal Aviation Regulations. And there are several of these that we're going to look at over the next couple of lessons. Um, they are worth... Uh, reading through, especially ones that are relevant to private pilots, either the certification uh, or else the type of VFR flying that we're doing. Um, I'll try and point out some of the really specific ones to go and, and focus on, uh, but in general, giving the FARs uh, a read through is, is a good idea. Not necessarily the whole thing, because there's a lot of stuff that'll be irrelevant to a private pilot, um, but there's a lot of stuff in there that is super relevant, and it is the regulations that we fly under. Um, so you need to be aware of, of what they say. So let's use this as one example. So I'm going to open up um, my notes on these are uh, just the overview with the intent to then go into the actual FARs. And we'll do that in a second here. A couple key things that this addresses, vigilance. Um, oh, well, let's, let's actually go in and just look at it. So I pulled out two that are, um, I think, really important uh, quotes to make sure that I'm like when I see this in shorthand, I want to know what it is, but you need to memorize the full right away rules because you're going to encounter them while you're flying. And so you can't, um, like these two aren't enough for that. Okay, so let's go in. I have the FARs on my foreflight. 
uh, app. So if you're using Fourth Flight, it'll be in there. Um, if you are just online, you can also find them. Just search uh, FAR 91113, uh, 91113. But here we go, Federal Aviation Re Regulations, Part 91. Okay, so let's go into flight rules. And you can see all these different chapter headings is kind of a useful way to start to look at what things, um, uh, like what the different chapters all cover. Let's go into right away rules, except water operations. Okay, so uh, the first bit here, I'm looking at the very bottom in applicability section does not apply to operation of aircraft on water. So that doesn't apply to us because we're uh, a land aircraft. So the first piece here is the general section. There are a lot of regulations that open with a general statement that becomes kind of the backbone for a lot of how to think about these things. Uh, another one is when we talk about minimum altitudes you're allowed to fly at, there's sort of a catch-all at the very beginning that says you need to be able to make a safe landing if you lost engine power. Um, and so uh, students, when they're studying this, they'll sometimes focus too much on the really... Uh, like the specific list of things that come after. Um, but you want to make sure that you're also giving uh, a good amount of weight to these opening kind of sections. So when weather conditions permit, um, whether your instrument or visual, so we're visual flight rules, we're not flying in the clouds. Vigilance shall be maintained by each person operating an aircraft so as to see and avoid other aircraft. So your responsibility for right of way and for collision avoidance one of the key tenets of that is the idea of see and avoid. So we talk about that 10 degree of scanning the sky. That's one technique to make sure that you're effectively seeing and then able to avoid other aircraft. If you have right of way, um, so when, when the section gives right of way to an aircraft, the pilot shall give way to that aircraft and shall not pass over, ahead or under, unless well clear. Basically meaning that if you're going to uh, exercise your right of way to maybe overtake someone or something like that, um, I'm sorry, uh, let me say this differently. If you are uh, interacting with another aircraft and right of way rules apply to the situation, the expectation is that you're um, passing well clear. And so this is something that comes up um, if you go out flying and maybe someone is overtaking your aircraft, they're a faster aircraft, they're flying around, that person overtaking should pass you well clear of your aircraft. It shouldn't be like the wings are almost touching. That would be really dangerous. All right, so now we get to some of the specifics about right-of-way. Aircraft in distress have right-of-way over all other aircraft. When aircraft are converging and they're of the same category, we'll talk about the categories in a second, um, and they're approximately the same altitude, uh, except if you're head-on, which we'll talk about also in a second. The aircraft to the other's right-of-way to the other's right has right-of-way. So just to draw that out real quick, if we, can I zoom in super far? Yeah, I think I can. So if we have one aircraft that's flying like this and another one that's flying like this, the aircraft to this, so um, this aircraft one and aircraft two, aircraft two is to the right of aircraft one as they're converging here. And so if those two aircraft are the same category, then the aircraft to the other's right has right of way. So this aircraft has right of way because it's to the right of the other aircraft. And so this aircraft needs to then give way um, and let them pass. So in this case, this aircraft should turn off to the left and give them space, right? So they should be passing well clear. Uh, or you could potentially turn to the right. Hopefully you you wouldn't be this close. Like they're almost touching. So that's that's problematic on its own. But hopefully that makes sense for what they mean by um, well clear. I'm sorry, what they mean by to the right of. Uh, there's a couple of uh, exceptions to this. And that's if they are of different categories. So for instance, a hot air balloon has right away over all other category of aircraft. A glider has right away over airship, powered air shoot, uh, powered parachute, uh, weight shift control, uh, 
etc. Airship has right away overpowered shoot, a couple other things. However, an aircraft towing or refueling other aircraft is right away over all other engine driven aircraft. So if someone is being towed, they have right away over everyone else, all other engine driven aircraft. If you're approaching head on, so we have an aircraft that's like this. Oops, uh, let me do it like that. And another aircraft that's like this. If you're approaching head on, then both pilots should alter course to the right. So this guy will turn right, this guy will turn right, and then we both avoid each other. If you're overtaking, and so we have one aircraft that is, can I do like that? Okay, good. If we have one aircraft that is going more slowly here, and another aircraft behind, maybe it's like a fighter jet kind of thing. That's kind of a weird fighter jet, but the aircraft overtaking, the aircraft being overtaken has right of way. So the aircraft being overtaken has right of way, and each pilot of the overtaking aircraft shall alter course to the right. So if they were going to overtake because they're a faster aircraft, they should alter course to the right and fly well clear of this aircraft. And last but not least, landing. Aircraft, while on final approach to land or while landing, something that we're talking a lot about today, have the right of way over other aircraft in flight or operating on the surface. Except they shall not except they shall not take advantage of this rule to force an aircraft off the runway surface, which has already landed and is attempting to make um, to make way for an aircraft on final approach. When two or more aircraft are approaching the airport for the purpose of landing, the aircraft at the lower altitude has right of way, but it shall not take advantage of this rule to cut in front of another which is on final approach to land or to overtake that aircraft. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Essentially, what they're saying is that if you're coming into land, you have right of way over aircraft that are not landing, um, either that are just in flight or aircraft that are on the surface. With the exception that you shouldn't be abusing this right of way rule to like force someone off the runway if they just landed or other things like that. So there's sort of this like, you know, don't use this right of way as a, a big stick to, to knock around other airplanes. Um, similar to that, if you have, let's say we have our runway here and we have an aircraft coming into land like that, and we have another aircraft coming into land from a higher altitude, the aircraft at the lower altitude has right away over the one at the higher altitude. So the one at the higher altitude has more altitude to work with. And so the more precarious positioned aircraft, the one below, um, has the right of way to land first. The same sort of caveat applies, which is However, you shall not use, um, shall not take advantage of this rule to cut in front of another aircraft on final approach to land or to overtake an aircraft. So if you have a slow aircraft coming in to land like this and another aircraft is really fast and comes screaming in below, you know, you could say that they technically have right away because they're below uh, and they're both coming in to land. But if you were, but what this rule is saying is that you shouldn't be using that coming in lower as a way to cut in line or to. Um, uh, or to overtake that aircraft. So, so specifically prohibiting kind of like shooting your way underneath um, to get that right of way. Okay, that's right of way. Um, these are important to be reviewing and memorize because um, you will use them in your day-to-day uh, -day flying. So, I mean, these are all, all important rules. Um, they're also what other pilots are expecting. So just like with the traffic pattern, it's important to be flying the pattern as a pattern because other pilots will anticipate that's what you're going to do. Same thing with right-of-way rules. All the other pilots know the right-of-way rules. You too should know the right-of-way rules. And so when you, for instance, are converging, you both know what to expect the other to do. All right, next topic here is runway incursion and then awareness of other operations such as parachuting. Let's actually talk about parachuting real quick, just because it's kind of a nice follow on to right of way rules. So a parachute would have right of way over us, a powered aircraft. Um, and similarly, a glider would have right of way. There's a couple of places you can find that information. One is just if you look at the airport itself, but another on the sectional, they'll actually have it marked sometimes where certain types of operation are. So if you can see up near Sonoma Valley, there's that, in, that uh, glider symbol. So that tells you that there's a lot of glider activity in that area. And so if you were going to go 
uh, flying there, you'd want to be aware that there may be gliders in that area. Um, you can also see parachuting operations look like, uh, here we go, little package drop looking thing. And so this symbol here tells you that there is uh, parachuting in the area. Again, something you should be aware of for um, collision avoidance. The last thing we're going to talk about, so these clearing procedures we are using for flying to make sure that we're aware of other traffic and that they can also see us. Scanning for traffic for that scene avoid. Right away rules for what we do when we actually encounter another aircraft in the air. Uh, awareness is more of a planning piece of it. The last one is runway incursion, which has to do with the ground operations and collision avoidance on the ground. So I'm going to clear this. Um, the ground operations topic is something the FAA has been pushing a lot more on as of late. Um, there's a couple of places you see this. One is in the ways, like what the FAA focuses on for publications. Um, also the things that they ask about, for instance, on check rides. So if you're going to go for your private pilot check ride, uh, your kind of final test before you get your license, um, knowing the kind of key topics that the FAA is currently emphasizing is a useful piece of information, as you might imagine. So runway incursion is, uh, well, let's dive in here. Actually, we can look at it. So I actually have two links here, and I believe I cleaned this up. Let me make a little to-do note real quick. I think I've now combined these into one. When I did my CFI check ride, so my uh, test via CFI, um, one of the key pieces of emphasis was all about runway incursion. Um, so unsurprisingly, it's a big thing the FAA is emphasizing. Uh, it's also a super important topic in general. Um, so okay, I think I already did uh, deduplicate them, but uh, I'll make a little note here. Okay, let's dive into runway incursions. So a runway incursion is the incorrect presence of an aircraft, vehicle, or person on a protected area of a surface designated for landing and takeoff of an aircraft. Planning and preparation are the best mitigations for runway incursions. So we'll talk about a couple examples here, actually. Um, I'm going to fold these to not to reveal too much just yet. So what this is saying essentially is... A runway incursion is when your aircraft is on a part of the um, runway where it's not cleared to be. And so you've, I'm sure, picked up that there's a really big emphasis on things like these uh, hold position markings, the double bars with the uh, double dashed bars on the other side um, that are on every single intersection that leads to the runway. There's also those... Uh, signs that we see on the left side of the runway that tell us that we're about to uh, cross onto the runway. All of these things are pieces of information to make sure that you're not accidentally entering the runway area. Another thing that you may not think about but is something to keep in mind, the requirement for an aircraft being in that protected area designated for a landing and takeoff is any part of the aircraft crossing that line. So if you, for instance, are coming up to an area uh, and maybe you're, for some reason, you're taxiing onto the runway here and you kind of park your aircraft like this, well, your wings probably stick out. This is going to be unclear. Let's say that you're kind of parked like, right, so you've parked at an angle here for whatever reason. Your wings probably stick out like that. And so you've actually crossed right there. You've crossed into the protected area for the surface designated for landing and takeoff. So that is a runway incursion. And so those sorts of inc uh, incidents have to be reported by uh, the airport if they occur. Um, this is something, like I said, the FAA is really trying to, to uh, improve on. Um, so, okay, so let's dive into a little bit of what this is and then what you can do to mitigate it. Uh, one example, I think this is kind of a, it's an example of a runway incursion that has a not bad outcome. Uh, runway incursions are um, really dangerous. I mean, it's an aircraft that's not where it's supposed to be, and that can lead to a lot of problems. Um, and there are a lot of, um, we'll say, dark examples um, as well. But this one sort of um, 
Harrison Ford related. And so I, I, I like it as a, a simple example. So 2017, an airport in Orange County, Harrison Ford accidentally landed on taxiway Charlie, uh, which is to the left of runway 20, left the one he had been cleared for. A Boeing 737 was holding short of 20 left, so they were at that whole position marking, on the taxi when Ford overflew them. So there's a little quote from the dialogue. After a long period of silence after landing, about two minutes on the recording, Ford asks, Tower, uh, nine hotel uniform, was that airline air... Uh, airplane supposed to be underneath me. The controller responded, uh, November 8 9 hotel uniform negative. He's holding short of 20 left. You landed on Charlie. Okay, so aircraft not supposed or not where it's supposed to be. Uh, incorrect presence, uh, protective area. Um, typically, we think of it the other direction. So it's like an aircraft that taxied onto a runway when it wasn't supposed to, it wasn't cleared to taxi. Um, this is sort of the flip side. It's a aircraft landing on a place where it wasn't supposed to be landing. So after Ford was cleared to taxi to the Signature East FBO, uh, he was told uh, in Husky Niner hotel uniform, possible pilot deviation. I need you to call the tower advisor and you have a pen ready to copy a number. Acknowledge and copy the phone tower number. So this is the sort of advise when you're ready to copy a number is sort of the universal indication that uh, someone wants to talk to you about something that happened. Couple risks, couple mitigations. The risk is that, uh, so this is pulled from a runway safety uh, resource, which is a really good one um, to read through. Although there are some responsibility across all types of aviation, uh, incursions are largely a general aviation problem with more than half occurring in general aviation under operations conducted under part 91. So you as a private pilot would be flying under Part 91, a general aviation uh, operation. And so the reason that we really emphasize this for private pilots is that this is something that is seen more um, frequently in gen general aviation. Several factors that lead to runway incursions, lack of situational awareness, unfamiliar with the airport or airport markings. So this would be you go to an airport, you didn't study the taxi diagrams before and you accidentally cross something that you're not allowed to cross. Distractions, chatty passengers or chatty passengers or being heads down on an electronic device. So something that um, I will tell passengers every time I fly with is a concept of a sterile cockpit. Sterile cockpit is actually I might even have it later. Uh, I probably should add that to this. Um, so a sterile cockpit is the idea of during um, high workload periods of flight, so taxiing, takeoffs, and landings and around the traffic pattern area. Uh, asking for a sterile cockpit means asking everyone in the airplane to be quiet while you focus on flying. So hold questions um, and essentially let you focus on flying the airplane. So if you have a distraction like a chatty passenger in the back, asking for a sterile cockpit while you're taxiing is a polite way of saying, hey, you got to Keep quiet because I got to focus on what I'm doing here. Um, and another one that leads to runaway incursions is fatigue, either physical or mental. We talked about with the pre-flight checklist, this idea of uh, pre-flighting the pilot with the I'm safe checklist. So I'm safe, illness, medication, uh, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and emotion or eating, um, depending on who you ask. And so fatigue is one of the ones that would show up uh, in that I'm safe checklist as a reason that you may not want to go flying. Couple mitigations for these. Uh, sterile cockpit, like I talked about, is something I use every time I go flying. I think it's a really good concept. You wanna understand the airport diagram and likely taxi routes throughout the airport. You wanna review and understand hotspots, which can be found on airport diagrams. So if we go to the, uh, this is the airport diagram of that example we just looked at. So here's Charlie and here's 20 left. So Harrison Ford was supposed to land on 20 left. Instead, he landed on Charlie over to the right here. Um, one of the things to do before you go flying is to look at an uh, airport diagram like this and say, okay, there are parallel taxiways. There are runways of this size and in this location. And so when you're lining up, you can um, already be aware of the types of confusion that you might encounter when you're trying to land. Another really important one is these hotspots. It says HS1, this little intersection here, HS2, that intersection, HS3. The hotspots are places where there is either a high likelihood 
or a history of runway incursions or collisions. Um, typically, it's like a complex or confusing taxiway or intersection. So if we go back to uh, this guy, uh, you can imagine that if you uh, taxi off here, maybe you're on, well, we can look at actually a specific example. I don't need to make one up. Um, and then in the airport facility directory, the AFD, that chart supplement, they have all of these hotspots described so you can read about what it was. So ATC will instruct pilots to turn from taxiway A onto taxiway, uh, sorry, taxiway Alpha onto taxiway Lima and hold short runway 20 left. Do not cross runway 20 left without authorization. So hotspot one, they've run into a problem where folks are crossing runway 20 left without authorization, that runway incursion. So if we go back then and look at the airport diagram, you can see that you're turning from Alpha onto Lima and then pilots were just crossing 20 left and continuing on probably to go to 20 right. So identifying that as a hotspot. Uh, but each of these then would have their own description of what's going on uh, and what you need to do about them. All right, uh, no one watch for runway holding position markings. That's these ones. If you haven't been cleared to cross it or you aren't sure, hold short and ask. So if you come up to one of these on the ground and you're kind of going, uh, did I get a clearance or was what I had received, they mean that I can go in there. Better to hold short and ask. Tower would much rather answer your question than have a, uh, a runway incursion. If you're in doubt about your route or where you are on the airport, just stop. It's okay to ask the controller or request progressive taxi instructions. So progressive taxi is something you might do if you get to an airport and either you're sent down a path that you weren't expecting, it wasn't what you planned for, or if you're at an unfamiliar airport for some other reason, that would be the tower then telling you specifically which way to turn at each intersection. All right, a couple additional resources here. There's the FAA website on runway incursions and then the runway safety information. These are both really good. Uh, and then here's the FAA's definition of it. So. All right, let's keep going here. So normal crosswind, takeoffs and landings. Uh, we talked about runway incursions, talked about awareness of other operations. If you are watching the video after the fact, now would be a really good time to pause, maybe stretch, because all of this collision avoidance um, is really important topics and it's worth giving it a second to sink in. Uh, I'm gonna take a slow drink of water and then we'll move on to some of the other topics here. All right, and if you are watching, you have any questions, always feel free to post in the chat. The next part we're gonna talk about, oh, actually one last thing I did wanna mention on Collision avoidance, we were doing go arounds yesterday and I mentioned that if there was, for instance, an aircraft on the runway, whether or not they were supposed to be there and you were coming in to land, that's a situation where you would do a go around and then deviate off to the right side of the runway. So you wanna uh, get away from the center line and make sure that you can keep that aircraft in sight. Um, if they're already on the runway, they may think that they're cleared to take off and you could have a situation where they're taking off and climbing out right alongside you. So you don't wanna be right above them. All right, let's talk about wake turbulence uh, from helicopters and from heavy aircraft. A smaller airport like Palo Alto where we're flying, you're unlikely to get really heavy aircraft landing here, but we will go to other airports in the area like San Jose or Livermore where you might get, um, or Hayward, where you might get uh, bigger, bigger aircraft coming in. You'll also have aircraft flying above you that'll have a certain amount of wake. I will talk about that in a second. Um, helicopters are pretty common at Palo Alto Airport, and so this is something that you are more or less, most likely going to encounter. So wake turbulence, a heavy, clean, a couple key takeaways, a heavy, clean, and, oops, let me do it this way, slow aircraft generate the largest wake turbulence. So if it's heavy, clean, and slow, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second, but remember heavy, clean, and slow generate the largest wake turbulence. To avoid wake turbulence, uh, there's a couple of bullets here. We're going to talk about each of these individually, but you want to avoid flying through another aircraft's flight path. Mm. You know what I'm going to do actually is let's 
go through this and summarize the key takeaways after, because I think it's going to be easier to see exactly what this is before we talk about how to avoid it. So let's go into the details. So what is wake turbulence? If you remember from uh, the induced drag video, if you were there for that bit, we talked about the wingtip vortices that get formed at the end of the wing. So when the wing generates lift, there's an area of high pressure below the wing and low pressure above the wing. And that's what, uh, that is part of the creation of lift process. Because there's an area of low pressure, or I'm sorry, high pressure below, that high pressure tries to rush around to the area of low pressure above. So in the middle of the wing, not much can happen, but at the end of the wing, it actually gets the ability to wrap around and create this vortex. So that's these vortex, uh, vortices that you see off the end of the wingtips, the wingtip vortices. And so any aircraft generating lift has some amount of wingtip vortex creation. The strength and size of the wingtip vortices depends on the um, amount of lift being generated, which relates to the angle of attack and it relates to the weight. So all things that we talked about during slow flight. And so, and also to some degree, the configuration that you're flying. Um, what that means in short is that if you have a heavy aircraft flying clean, so it's not using any of its flaps uh, and it's slow, so it has a high angle of attack, it's going to be creating a lot of lift uh, and it's going to be creating really big uh, wingtip vortices, uh, it was big and potentially powerful. So uh, heavy, clean, slow aircraft is where you really want to be uh, cautious and aware you're going to encounter heavy, uh, maybe clean, depending on the point in the descent, and slow aircraft, for instance, as they approach into land at maybe SFO, which is just down the road from us, right? So, you know, we might be flying at a Palo Alto here, uh, but SFO is right here, and one of their uh, approaches is right through here. So let's say that we have an aircraft flying in, and we're flying over here. Uh, I don't... The airspace is set up so that we shouldn't be that close to their vortices, but um, you still want to be aware if you have a big airplane flying over you um, that there is wind tip, wind tip vortex creation and they're going to be flying slower as they're coming into land. So uh, there's a couple other corridors that we often encounter. Actually, the most frequent one is coming into Hayward here or into Oakland because um, we'll often leave over this direction if we're going to go fly around um, that practice area we did for ground reference maneuvers. And then we have aircraft coming into Hayward or to Oakland. Okay, so this is the, uh, the weak uh, turbulence that wingtip vortices and the turbulence that they create. You want to avoid flying in certain areas. So one to know is that these uh, this wake falls and so it's actually moving downward and so it sinks several hundred feet per minute uh, which means you don't want to fly following another aircraft at an altitude within a thousand feet of that wake so you don't want to be less than a thousand feet below an aircraft that's um that would be generating wake uh, and you'll feel wake turbulence even on small aircraft it may not be strong enough to flip the airplane over which would be uh, concerned with a, a wake this big, it can roll the airplane 180 degrees and put you in a, a pretty bad position. Um, but you'll feel it even on smaller aircraft. You want to avoid, uh, I'm sorry, avoid turbulence from other aircraft uh, when they're takeoffs, taking off and landing. So remember the wingtip vortices are created when lift is generated. And so they stop being created when the airplane is touched down and they start being created when the airplane rotates. So if you're going to come in to land, you want to land after the touchdown point of an aircraft that might be generating wake, or you want to take off before the rotation point of an aircraft that might be generating wake in front of you. Another thing to know about is the vortex movement will change depending on the crosswind. So this is actually showing you two examples. Let's, I'm sorry, this is showing you a wingtip vortice from your right wing and from your left wing with a three knot crosswind. So in a three knot crosswind, the wingtip vortices roughly spread out. Uh, this doesn't show it very well. That also doesn't show it very well. Well, anyway, the wingtip vortices roughly spread out at about three knots over. And so that three knot crosswind will actually hold the wingtip vortices over the runway. So if you have someone, for instance, taking off 
here, there's a three knot crosswind. That'll keep the vortices on the runway longer and make it more hazardous. Um, otherwise, they kind of spread out to both sides of the runway over time. Okay, so this is really important. Um, uh, oh, this is that creation of, so there's the uh, low pressure above, high pressure below creates these wingtip vortices. That's another picture of it. Um, this is a really important concept, I think. This would be a really good video to watch, actually. Let's start next time with this helicopter wake turbulence video. It's uh, kind of dramatic. Um, and I think for that reason, it's a good one to know about. Um, because it's the kind of thing that really can happen with wake turbulence. Essentially, it's a small aircraft coming in after a helicopter, and they get totally flipped around. Um, at low altitudes, um, which can be really dangerous. So, oh, I'm surprised I don't have this in here. Okay. All right. So that's weak turbulence. So there's certain, oh, let's go look at the key takeaways for this. So there's a couple of key areas. You want to avoid flying through another aircraft's flight path or following an aircraft at an altitude within a thousand feet. You want to rotate prior to the point at which the preceding aircraft rotated when taking off. And you want to approach to land uh, after the point where the other aircraft uh, contacted the runway. If you're ever unsure, just give three minutes for turbulence to dissipate. So if you either missed where the aircraft landed or you're not sure where it rotated, just give a couple more minutes. If you're unsure um, and you need more time, always feel free to ask the tower. It's a safety consideration and, and they'll give it to you if you need it. All right, two more topics here before we get into the mechanics of landing. So. Next one is wind shear avoidance. Wind shear is a change in wind speed or direction over a, sh a short distance. So you can have wind shear that goes horizontally. If you have maybe at a uh, thousand feet of uh, altitude, if the wind is going uh, from the north and maybe at 2000 feet of altitude, if it's coming from the west, there's probably a shearing in there somewhere as the wind changes direction. There are four common sor sources of low level wind shear, frontal activity, thunderstorms, temperature inversions, and surface obstructions. And the best way you can prevent a hazardous encounter with wind shear is to know the wind shear is there, know the magnitude of the change, and be prepared to correct or go around immediately. So is that key, be ready to go around. You wanna be ready to go around on every approach to landing because you never know if you're gonna encounter something on the runway. You also wanna be alert to the possibility of wind shear, especially when flying in and around thunderstorms and frontal systems. So when we talk about weather, especially for cross-country planning, we'll look at this more. Let's look at this. what this looks like. So. Here's one. This is uh, on a short list for one of my least favorite diagrams, but it sort of shows you this warm air mass and cold air mass and then a frontal line. And you can see that the air of the cold air mass rotates or is uh, going in this direction and the air of the warm air mass is moving in this direction. So if you're an aircraft, as you fly across the front here, you're actually getting a shift from a crosswind to a tailwind. And so that change in direction then is a wind shear. And if it's really severe, you may actually, um, uh, you, well, you'll definitely notice it in the airplane, uh, if not in your ground or your um, uh, wind correction angle, then you may even feel it as you're as you're crossing through those. Um, but if it's really severe, it can be uh, pretty pretty bumpy. Thunderstorms. So thunderstorms have a lot of different types of uh, shearing going on, but there's especially this. Uh, vertical shearing. So they have up, down, updrafts and downdrafts. And so if you're an aircraft and you fly through this section, um, there's, you know, you might be getting uh, hundreds or I think it's thousands of feet per minute uh, updrafts followed by thousands of feet per minute downdraft. And so all of a sudden your aircraft is going way up and way down. Um, and it can be uh, nearly impossible, uh, if possible at all, to control the aircraft through that sort of thing. Um, we'll talk more about thunderstorms when we get to uh, weather planning, but the general guidance around thunderstorms is to avoid them. Um, there is not a situation where you want to be flying uh, even near a thunderstorm. Um, and it's one of the most dangerous uh, weather occurrences for aviation. Um, we'll talk a lot about reasons why later on, but one of them is this wind shearing updraft, downdraft sort of effect. 
Another one is these temperature inversions. So temperature inversion would be if you have, for instance, uh, warm air above and cool, calm air below. You'll notice there's these sort of mountains here. So where we are in the Bay Area, we do get these temperature inversions. Uh, so we might have just air kind of sitting below and it'll be a turbulent layer here where uh, wind may be moving uh, above it in either a different direction or stronger. Um, where I did some of my training in Wisconsin, we used to get temperature inversions that would lead to low level wind shear uh, concerns actually. So when you're flying close to the ground, it would be maybe five knots of wind, but then at a thousand feet at pattern altitude, um, the wind could be 15 to 20 knots. And so one of the conversations I would have regularly with my CFI was, okay, so what is this wind shear going to be like for me taking off? And, and is this a concern that I need to have for flying? Um, so knowing those sort of weather patterns, and then also being aware that if you fly at this boundary layer, it can be pretty turbulent. Um, so I've had flights I've done with folks around the Bay Area where if I'm flying right at the uh, top of the haze, it's just super, super bumpy. But even a little bit below or a little bit below it, above, it's just fine. And last one on here is surface obstructions. This would be like if there's buildings or other things that cause the wind to move in um, odd directions, uh, especially uh, something that anything that would cause that change in wind speed or direction over a short distance. Okay, so these are some of the common sources for it. A couple of details that you should be aware. Wind shear is, uh, can occur either horizontally, uh, like we saw with the uh, temperature inversion, or vertically, like you saw with the thunderstorm, and is most often associated with strong temperature inversions or density gradients. While wind shear can occur at any altitude, low-level wind shear is especially hazardous due to the proximity of an aircraft to the ground. So you heard me mention already once this low-level wind shear concern. Let's talk about why that is. So let's say that you're coming into land and there's this shearing going on. So above the shear, we have this strong headwind and below the shear, there's no wind. As you're flying into land, you have this nice glide path set up that'll take you to the runway. Um, the problem is that as soon as you cross, and that, that depends on the fact that you're moving through this air mass that has this headwind. But as soon as you cross into the zero wind, where you have this wind shear, you're losing some of your performance. Um, and that'll make you, uh, let me use some numbers on this so it actually tracks more right. So we're coming in on final, right? And we'll use some exaggerated numbers, although you know wind shears can be really strong. So this is why it's important, um, but hopefully it'll illustrate the point a little bit. So we know that the aircraft will stall at 40 knots. On landing configuration. And so let's say that we're coming, and we also know that our uh, landing approach speed is 65 knots. So let's say we're coming in at 65 knots and we have a headwind of 30 knots. So we're flying our normal approach to land speed and we have a really strong headwind of 30 knots. And we have a nice lined up for the runway. As we cross this wind shear line, all of a sudden we lose that 30 knots of headwind which is the equivalent of the aircraft slowing down 30 knots instantaneously, right? So we were coming in at 65, we crossed this line, we lose that headwind. It is the same as us losing 30 knots of speed. Well, if we were flying at 65 knots, subtract off 30 knots from that, and suddenly you're flying at 35 knots, which is below stalling speed. And so then you could have a stall uh, just below the ground. Um, and so depending on the altitude, it may or may not be recoverable. Uh, in practice, you're more likely to get a wind shear that's lighter than that. Um, I, I mean, it, let me say that differently. The wind shear totally depends on the conditions of the day. So you may have uh, you know, lots of days where you don't have any wind shear. Certain areas are more likely to have wind shear than not. Like I said, where I did a lot of my training, wind shear was pretty common. And so it's something that we learn to account for in our approaches. Um, but uh, you also want to make sure that you're thinking about the potential for wind shear when you're thinking about the need to go around. So if you cross this wind shear level and all of a sudden you see your airspeed indicator go to 35, um, you know you have a stall and so you need to do your stall recovery, which right nose down, full throttle, flaps to uh, 20. You're also no longer on a stabilized approach and so you should be going, doing a go around. Any kind of dramatic change in airspeed like that should, should initiate a go around. I already said this, but it's most uh, most commonly associated with frontal passages, thunderstorms, temperature inversions, strong upper winds. There's one other one that um, is really important to know about, and that's microbursts. So microbursts are a very severe form of low-level wind shear, LLWS. 
There's a few visual clues you might see. You can see an intense rain shaft at the beginning, but Virga at the cloud base, uh, sort of like rain that doesn't hit the ground, or a ring of blowing dust um, that may be the only visual cue. So a microburst is where essentially the uh, air above a specific location sort of falls down really rapidly. And there's some um, really uh, helpful diagrams that kind of show them developing, but essentially it's sort of this like pocket of air that's falling, falling, that eventually hits the ground and spreads out. And so when the microburst is developed, you get this really strong downdraft from the falling air, and then you get this spreading out of the wind in both directions. The problem with a microburst is you have a headwind when you're flying into the microburst and a tailwind when you're flying out of it. So it's that same thing that we were talking about with this, where you have this sudden change in wind speed. Sudden change in wind speed also then changes your, uh, your airspeed, your airspeed you're currently flying at. So if you were climbing out, maybe you're climbing out at uh, 74 knots, so you're flying out at VY. And let's say that you have a 30 knot change in wind, all of a sudden then you're flying at you know, 44 uh, knots uh, and you need to uh, quickly correct for that by you know, lowering the nose, making sure to recover from the stall and then um, continuing to fly uh, until you speed back up to address the tailwind that you now have. So that changing wind speed can be a, a hazard for that reason. Really good resource here from the EFA on wind shear. Oh, we got a barking pup. Someone's moving in next door, it sounds like. Okay, give me a second. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a tough being a pup. Uh, okay, so close out on wind shear. Wind shear is a sudden drastic change in wind speed or direction over a very small area. The last one you should be aware of is gust factor. And this is something that we think about for gusty conditions to give ourselves a little bit more of a margin of safety. It sort of relates to wind shear in some ways, and um, that it's that kind of sudden change in, in wind speed. Um, but if we know that we're coming into an airport that has, well, let me, I'll open that in a second. But if we know that we're coming into an airport that has maybe 20 knot winds gusting to 30 knots, so it's really, really windy and we have, or maybe we'll say 10 knot winds gusting to 20 knots. So we have 10 knots of additional gust. Um, that means that the standard flow of the air is going to be at 10 knots, but throughout our landing, we could have up to 20 knots increase or 20 knots decrease, right? Maybe we're coming in while it's gusting 20, and then all of a sudden the wind goes away and it's suddenly 10 knots only. We have that same sort of concern we do with low-level wind shear, which is a sudden change in the uh, speed of the wind is the same potentially as us losing or gaining that much performance. And so if we were coming in at uh, 65 knots on our final and it was gusting to 20 and then all of a sudden the wind pulled back and now it's only at 10 that would be the same as us now flying at 55 knots instead of 65 knots right we lose that much performance to account for that when we're flying in we add what's called a gust factor to our final approach speed so if we're coming in at uh, 65 knots normally but we know that the wind is gusting 10 knots above so maybe it's 10 knots of wind gusting to 20 knots, so we have a 10 knot margin, we're going to add half of that additional gust to our approach speed to give us some additional airspeed to work with in case the wind dies suddenly. So people or pilots refer to that as the gust factor. Um, so let's say that the wind gusts are 15 knots and your normal approach speed is 70 knots, then you'd add half of that, so you'd add 77 knots. In our case, it might be, uh, you know, Maybe we have 10 knots of gusts, so this is this airspeed beyond the, um, the, the airspeed beyond the normal airspeed for the day. So whatever the gusts are beyond, I feel like I'm saying that poorly. Like if the wind report is that it's um, five knots of wind gusting to 10 knots of wind, then our gust factor would be, uh, let's do it differently, five knots of wind gusting to 13 knots of wind, then our gust factor would be eight knots because it's that 13 minus five gives us the eight knots. Uh, gusting and so we would add half of that four knots to our approach speed and again that's just so we have a little bit of a buffer on our approach speed in case we do lose wind while we're coming in that gives us enough airspeed to recover from that that also can mean that you're coming in faster and coming in faster on an approach will mean that you are more likely to float 
down the runway, which means you may use more of the runway. And so again, if it's gusty, as with every landing, but especially if it's gusty, you want to be ready for a go around if anything looks um, bad. And especially if you haven't landed in the first half of the runway, then you should be initiating a go around. All right, great. So we're actually more or less on time, believe it or not. I mentioned that ground today would be about an hour and a half, and then we'll probably go to about 1.30. So we'll do about an hour of flying to apply some of these things. Um, these are important safety concerns to be thinking about on future flights. If we were going out uh, in the real world, these are the kinds of topics that I would point to and sort of ask you about while we're flying. Maybe we see a jet fly overhead. You know, what is our safe altitude to be flying below that jet? Uh, maybe we're uh, being overtaken by an aircraft. We might say something like, you know, what, what do we expect this aircraft to do now? Um, things like that. So... Um, also, when we're looking at the weather reports, we'll talk about gust, wind shear. Oh, one thing I did want to mention for wind shear, um, which also should be on this actually, is uh, places to know about wind shear. So I said that one of the best things you can do is be prepared. I'm sorry, know the wind shear is there is one of the best ways you can mitigate the hazards of wind shear. Um, there's a couple of ways you might know. Some airports will actually have low-level wind shear sensors, especially big airports, and so they might be able to detect a microburst on final, um, and then they would have aircraft wait until they go, uh, until that microburst has disappeared. You also may see it in the uh, winds aloft. So for instance, we actually looked at the winds aloft, I think three or four days ago at the bay, and it was uh, like five knots at the surface, but then like 25 knots at 1,000 feet. So that's a really good indication that there's probably some shearing level going on because the wind speed is going to increase so much in such a short amount of time. So you might see that in your winds aloft forecast. Uh, I can pull up the winds aloft forecast as a reminder. In fact, I may even have the one we were looking at. Yeah, here we go. So this would be an indication to me that there might be uh, wind shearing going on. So at 500 feet, we have 12 knots of, air of wind, but at 2,500, we have 24 knots. So in that 2,000 feet, we're gaining... 10 knots of airspeed. Maybe it's really gradual. Maybe we won't even notice it, but there's a good chance that there's going to be some amount of, uh, of shearing. Um, if the direction of the wind was significantly different, that would be another type of shearing, right? Even if it's the same speed, if it changes direction. Um, the last place that's really, really useful and important to check and something that we'll spend more time on later is these PIREPs. So PIREPs are um, pilot reports. They are the best way to get the actual current weather conditions um, from other pilots. So for instance, there's not very many in the bay right now, but if we go up here, we can see a pilot reported um, that over this airport, uh, looks like Redwood Coast Humboldt County Airport, at 3,000 feet, they said that the base of the clouds was uh, 3,200 feet. So they were at 3,000, they found the base of the clouds was just above them. We'll talk more about how to read this. One important thing to know is to look at the aircraft type. So um, uh, BE-58 is a little bit bigger plane. And so, of course, this is a cloud level report. So it doesn't, like, that's going to apply to us all the same. But if, a, if an airplane reports turbulence uh, at some altitude and it's a 747, it's probably pretty bad turbulence because an aircraft that big is feeling it. Whereas if a Cessna 172 reports turbulence, um, a bigger aircraft may not feel it at all. Um, there are urgent PIREPs, which are coded differently. They show up with this little uh, exclamation point and it'll have UUA at the beginning. Um, oh, this is a great, this is a great example. Actually, this is a low-level wind shear incident. So essentially what this is saying is that an aircraft um, was during descent onto runway 32 there was a gain of 2, 000, or 20 knots at 1,200 feet AGL. And so that is an indication for, and this was only 22 minutes ago, so this is really recent information. And so that is an indication if you were also coming in to this airport, you'd want to know that there was a gain of 20 knots coming in on runway 32. Also useful to know that if you were um, flying through that altitude in the other direction, there's a shearing that's going on. So you may, you know, if you were instead flying instead of flying down, um, I'm sorry, flying, I guess, up uh, like this, right? So he's probably landing, let me just zoom in here. 
Um, so coming in here, we're losing or we're gaining 20 knots, but that means if you're flying the other direction, you're losing 20 knots um, as you cross this 1,200 feet AGL. Uh, often low level wind shear, especially severe ones, will show up as urgent pyre ups like that with the exclamation point. Um, not always, but they're definitely good to check. Before you go flying, this is part of your standard weather brief, so you're looking to see if other pilots have reported that. Okay. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, so I'll keep going here. Um, always feel free to interrupt me. As we get into the uh, VR flying, it'll be harder for me to see the chat. So, um, uh, But you're all obviously still welcome to ask questions, and I'll just get to them when I uh, pause and, and get a chance to look around. So let's talk about a stabilized approach to landing. A stabilized approach means that you're coming in on a constant glide path to your point of landing. So the aircraft isn't climbing and descending to try and stay on glide path. You're not having to change your power settings all the time or your elevator. Really, the aircraft should be, a, a, the landing should be a very nice, smooth sort of um, approach down at a, a fixed angle at that fixed glide path. The runway as you're um, approaching, so the way that we do this land, uh, this a landing process is we pick an aiming point on the runway. So in this case, they mark it with that red um, cross. And we're watching that aiming point grow in the window um, with everything else around it growing away. But this should stay fixed in location in the window and it should look as though everything else is growing around it. If everything else is growing around that aiming point, that means that you are flying directly to the aiming point, which is the goal. So we'll choose an aiming point. Usually I use the threshold at Palo Alto and we'll watch that uh, everything else around it grow around the threshold. Uh, the other thing is that the runway, what the runway looks like will change a little bit as you get down, but it should look, this is a pretty good example of what that'll look like. Um, but you want to be flying down at that constant uh, glide path. So it shouldn't be something where you're climbing up and, and down a bunch. When we're in the pattern, so this is a lot of the stuff from yesterday, so I'm going to fly through it really quick. Uh, on our downwind leg, remember a good landing starts with a good approach. Good approach starts with good pattern. So we'll talk about the pattern and then we'll really focus on the uh, landing uh, mechanics. So for downwind leg, awareness of traffic, you want to have your power setting configuration, airspeed for downwind. So remember we use 2000 uh, RPM and no flaps to get 90 knots on the downwind. We want to do our pre-landing checklist. You've heard me say GUMPS, G-U-M-P-S, that's gas undercarriage, mixture, propeller, seat belts. In this airplane, we don't have, we don't have to lower the landing gear, so there's no undercarriage to lower, but I do check my brakes to make sure that I'm not gonna be surprised by any of that. Um, FCC gumps is a variation on this that also pulls in flaps, cowl flaps, and carb heat. Um, we have flaps in this aircraft, we don't have cowl flaps or carb heat. Um, it also, this is, I think, a very useful acronym. Um, I'm more in the habit of using gumps, which is the shorter one. Um, but FCC gumps is a really useful one too, and thought I'd put that out there if you like it. This is the pre-landing checklist that you want to do in the POH. So gumps is a good um, uh, flow to follow to make sure you're not missing anything, but then double checking the checklist you have is good. You need crosswind correction as necessary. Remember crabbing into the wind to account for any crosswind. If we're downwind to beam the numbers, then we start our descent, assuming that tower hasn't asked us to extend or there's no traffic. After we turn base, we want to turn at a 45 degree to the approach end of the runway. So we're coming in to land. We'll know we're at a 45 degree because either you can see it because you are got that kind of geometry mind going. Otherwise, 45 degrees is halfway between, when you're looking out your uh, back window, if the runway is halfway between the wing and the fuselage, then it's 45 degrees. So um, you want to turn base from 45 degrees to the approach end of the runway, adjust configuration. Uh, for base, so remember 80 knots, I'm sorry, 80 knots when we get a beam the numbers and 10 degrees flaps. As we turn base, we go 70 knots, 20 degrees flaps, still 1500 RPM. And then we're evaluating our altitude, distance, and wind, and we're correcting as necessary. So our base leg is really our best chance to get a good look at the runway, judge our height above it, and try to make any adjustments we need to to line up for a really clean final approach. Final approach is that final approach into landing. You're going to do a coordinated turn to roll out on the runway center line and establish crosswind correction as needed. And when we're flying in, we're going to be using that crab angle we talked about before. So that's what this is sort of showing. This is showing it really low to the runway, but that's what it's meaning is as you're coming into the runway, you want to have that, that crabbed angle. 
when you're actually this low, we're going to use a side slip. We'll talk about that in about two seconds. Um, but we use a crab as we're flying the approach. We set our flaps, trim for uh, uh, we set our flaps and trim for a final approach speed, uh, 65. Pitch for airspeed, power for altitude. We talk about this a lot. When we're flying slow like that, we want to pitch for airspeed. Use our power for altitude. And uh, we'll use the glide path indicator if we have it available. At Palo Alto, we do. I went before this lesson and confirmed that the add-on seems to have the correct glide path indicator. Um, as we get, how do we want to do that? Actually, let's fly. Today, we'll set our aiming point. So typically, I use the aiming point as the threshold. Um, we're actually going to use the aiming point as the location where the glide path indicator is so that we can follow the glide path indicator all the way down. Um, that means we'll be landing a little bit down the runway, but that's okay. I prefer to land at the beginning of the runway, use as much as we have available. Um, but we can do that at least for today's uh, practice. The other thing you want to have one hand on your stick or the yoke and the other on the throttle. So you're ready for a go around uh, as soon as there's an indication that you need to go around. You want to maintain the runway center line as you're flying in with this crabbed approach. You should be flying in along the center line. The last thing you do then for the final approach, this is the descent down to the runway, is you're flying to that aiming point. So you can see this aiming point they have on the diagram here is sort of they're using the numbers of the aiming point, and you can see the path that it's taking down. There's something I really don't like about this image, uh, which I want to call out, and that's that it shows the next stages here as though you're then climbing back up. It has this like kind of dip and back up. That's wrong. It should be uh, holding off the runway, but you're not climbing. That's that's bad technique. So I didn't like this because of the second half of the, of the diagram, but I like this aiming point uh, picture. And that's what the handbook has. Okay, so let's talk about that roundout and flare. So we're coming in on our approach. And as we get to um, about one uh wingspan above the runway right as you're entering ground effect then you're going to start your round out uh also called the flare i like round out a lot more because flare gives people the impression uh, i think the wrong impression a round out seems more correct to what we're actually doing so you're judging your speed and altitude on short final right as you're coming in you're using ailerons to maintain the center line and rudder to keep the nose pointed down the runway parallel to the center line this is the side slip so as we're coming in on the final approach, we're using a crabbed approach. As we get down to the round out, we're transitioning to a side slip. So we'll start doing that at about 200 feet um, AGL, 200 feet before the touchdown area. Um, just to get a little bit of practice, we can actually do a slide slip all the way down the approach if we wanted to, technically allowed. The reason that I don't like to do that and I would discourage others from doing it the side slip is a cross-controlled maneuver. So we spent all this time really developing the skill to keep the ball centered, make sure you're always flying coordinated. And then when we do the side slip, we're suddenly saying, actually, do fly cross-controlled. Um, we have to do it to keep the fuselage of the plane aligned with the center line. So we need to land so that our aircraft is moving straight down the runway. And so we do that with a side slip um, but it does mean that we're cross-controlled. So we're using our rudder to keep the nose aligned with the center line and our ailerons the opposite direction into the wind to keep uh, from moving left and right. Uh, as long as we keep our rudder, our nose pointing down the runway, we'll be in good shape for not having side load. If instead we let our plane drift sideways, we're going to put all this force on the uh, tire. One, it's bad for the landing gear and the tire, but it also can cause the plane to, for instance, flip over or something else. So... You notice that the wing is up, upwind here. That's wrong. It should be that the wind, the wing is down um, as you're uh, down into the wind for the side slip. And you want to touch down such that you have no movement left or right, which means that you have no force that's going to be put on this wheel. It should just be kind of a clean touchdown and then set the other wheel down. Uh, yep, so this is entering ground effect. And then the last thing is you use your peripheral vision to judge the descent range. So we'll, descent rate, excuse me. Um, so we'll talk about that, especially with the touchdown piece here. So as we get to the, uh, so we're starting the, uh, this is the final approach and then the round out here. And in the round out, we're um, uh, removing power 
um, setting up our side slip, or we're probably already in our slide slip at that point, getting aligned with the center line. And essentially, we're um, letting the airplane come down to the runway and then slowly decreasing our descent rate. So during the touchdown, all you're doing is you're holding the airplane off the runway until it can no longer fly. And then at that point, you should be about a foot off the runway and that'll let the airplane gently settle down. So calling back to the first thing we said about landing, our goal in landing is to smoothly transfer weight from the wings to the wheels. So to do that, we hold the airplane off by giving uh, increasing back pressure until we come to our touchdown attitude, which should be about a full stall attitude. So uh, if you hear the stall horn as, as you're landing, that's often a good sign. That means that you've got a You've stalled just at the point that you're landing, assuming you don't drop out of the, you know, as long as, long as you're right above the runway and not too high. Um, so for that touchdown, increasing back pressure to slow our descent rate until we get to just above the runway, about a foot, and then we just hold off and let the airplane uh, fly itself to the ground. So as you hold off at that rate, the airplane's gonna decelerate. As it's decelerating, it'll lose lift. As it loses lift, it'll gently settle its way down. You shouldn't need to be doing anything to force the, the airplane down, it, it'll just automatically fly its way down because it doesn't have enough power to stay flying. Um, one thing, a concept that I really like that I'll pass on to you is to, when you're uh, going through the round out and flare, you want to pull back on the elevator to uh, hold the aircraft off the runway but you never want to push the elevator forward. So you can think of it kind of like, like a roller coaster where they, you know, as it like clinks its way up to the top of the row goes like clink 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 all the way and it's locking in at each step you can think of the same sort of thing with your arm for the round out so once you pull the elevator back to a certain point you want to hold it there and you don't want to let it go forward and then you're holding that attitude and then if you need to um once you get to the specific landing attitude you're just going to keep holding it until the aircraft loses enough lift to settle onto the runway on its own Another concept I've heard that I really like is letting the runway come up to you. So really you're just holding off of the runway and because you don't have enough lift to stay flying, eventually the runway is gonna come up to you. Rollout then is when you're actually on the, the runway, you wanna maintain the center line with rudder, deflect ailerons into the wind. So just like we did when we were taxiing, deflect ailerons to the wind, gradually increasing to full deflection at taxi speed and gentle braking. For taxi, exit the runway, completely beyond the hold short lines. You want to be out of the runway area. Stop and complete the after landing checklist, and then contact ground frequency unless you're staying with tower. So this is for the actual pattern work. Couple landing issues to avoid. Um, bouncing on landing, especially for early in your training, is a good indication to go around. Uh, so if you find yourself bouncing, full power, flaps 20, and um, accelerate before climbing out. You um, can recover from a bounce, especially a, a mild bounce, by holding the correct landing attitude and sort of restabilizing the airplane to just descend down and land. Um, you may need a little bit of power application to do that sort of thing. Um, that's something you can work on a little bit later in your training. For now, it's, it's better to just focus on having a good first touchdown. One concern that you can run to is if you have multiple bounces in a row, because that may be a sign of porpoising. If you start to detect this sort of thing, you want to go around right away. Don't let it develop. So essentially what happens with porpoising is you have this angle of attack you're coming into land. And then if you um, hit the runway too quickly, too hard, um, the weight of the tail causes the nose to pitch up. That pitching up moment increases the angle of attack and that creates more lift. You have more lift, all of a sudden you're flying again and then you lose that lift and you're back to your normal angle of attack. And the same thing happens because you're bouncing up and you're bouncing up and you're bouncing up. And you can end up in this situation where the plane starts to oscillate until it becomes uncontrollable. And, um, and then you'll get a prop strike where the plane will rotate over its forward or a bunch of other things can happen that are bad. Um, so if you, if you have one bad bounce, you should just go around. If you have a, a developing like two bounces in a row, definitely go around. Um, otherwise, this porpoising is a, a risk that you want to avoid. All right, last but not least, before we go flying, a couple common errors. Getting behind the airplane, missing radio calls, missing traffic, etc. Behind the airplane is a concept you'll hear 
uh, periodically in aviation. I mention this uh, semi-regularly, but the most important thing, or the two most important things in aviation are the next two things. And so that's sort of a, a response to this getting behind the airplane. You wanna be thinking about the next two things you have to be doing. Forgetting checklists is a problem, especially gumps check. Non-stabilized approach. Um, that's if you're changing your, uh, you're kind of going up and down to try and catch the glide path. Flaring too high or too low, bouncing or ballooning, poor directional control or drifting off center line, and excessive braking. So we want to be using the uh, wings to brake. We don't want to be on the brakes themselves as much as we can avoid it because uh, we have enough runway to work with. Obviously, if you need the brakes, use the brakes. All right, let's go fly. I hear uh, there's some folks blowing leaves in our back area. It doesn't sound like it's getting picked up on the microphone, so I will not worry about it. Um, but let me get set up here for VR. So uh, pardon me for a minute. I'm going to mute the mic and move around a couple of things on my desk. So just a moment. Great question, uh, uh, Favax. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, yes, we are. So uh, reduces wear on the brake pads, and essentially there's no because we have enough runway to use it. Um, using the uh, the drag of the wings themselves, aerodynamic braking, you might hear it called, um, is just a better use of uh, resources. We aren't burning through the brake pads, uh, putting that wear on. That, that's that's essentially the reason. Um, and it's a good habit to get into. I think the flip side would be if you're uh, getting in the habit of getting on the brakes really hard, um, one, burning through the brake pads, but also heating them up, uh, making them less effective. And so, yeah, just using, uh, using the wings when we can to slow down. Yeah, good question. Should scroll up real quick and make sure there's not um, other questions in the chat. All right, I think that's it. So I'm gonna put my headset on so I won't be able to see the chat for a little bit here. Um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I am going to uh, just start us right on the runway. So we're gonna skip over the um, pre-flight and checklists and run up and all of that, which of course in a real flight, Go through the whole thing, make sure the airplane is safe to fly, check before we actually take it up in the air. Um, but we'll lean on the luxury of the sim here to, uh, to save a little bit of time. Okay, so it is clear skies in Palo Alto today, and I'm on runway 31. Just loading up here. See, I suppose while it's loading, I can run through uh, completion standards. So the learner must become proficient at flying stabilized approaches to landing with smooth control application, touch and safe touchdown and rollout on the first third of the runway length, proper control application relative to crosswind. 
uh, homework, reading the wind shear, um, FAA write-up is really good. Uh, it's not super long either. And then you should be making steady progress on ground school at this point. So um, we go into some amount of depth, but really my goal is to teach you how to be a safe and proficient pilot. Um, there's a lot more on the knowledge side that we wouldn't have time to get into, or I mean, it's literally an entire ground school um, to get into that kind of depth of knowledge. So um, of course, if you're just tuning in uh, to learn here and there, I think that's awesome. And uh, you definitely don't need to be in a full ground school. Um, but for the pre-solo test, there's a number of topics that you would want to have covered from your ground school. Recommended uh, homework, flying the cha or chair flying the landings. All right, we are loaded up here. Let me switch over to VR again. See if this is all working. Okay, encouraging. Right, and I'm gonna try and uh, zoom out enough that we can look at the full traffic pattern. And we'll see how my shape is today. So this is gonna be a problem. I'm setting up this computer to fly with the microphone and everything, it reminds me of all the same um, kind of like flight deck management stuff, so kind of funny. I like when you get in the airplane to fly, you got to make sure your cords are put away, your iPad is um, secured in, that kind of stuff. Uh, same sort of things. Okay. Self-situated here. So I mentioned this yesterday. Uh, let me make sure my... Microphone audio level seems okay. Yep. Bring it a little bit closer, maybe. Let me see. Okay, that should be all right. Uh, let me know how that audio is for folks listening. Uh, I can try and play with it a little bit. Um, sort of giving myself enough motion to actually move my head forward without uh, hitting the microphone. But um, okay. So, like I said, my preferred. Uh, seat height is to be able to see just the top of the cowling there, so this is pretty good for me. And I think we are ready to go. So we would have uh, the tower bugged into the radio. It looks like Flight Sim has already done that for us. The lights, camera action before crossing the threshold here. So there's our lights. Uh, camera, we do not have our ADS-B transponder on. Well, we turn Oh, we do, excuse me. Yep, they have it plugged in, great. And uh, action, so we check our trim looks good. Our flaps are set for 10, mixture is rich. And so, okay, now we're just doing normal takeoff. We have no crosswind. Um, oh, I have a mini brake on. Uh, one other thing that's kind of useful that I, uh, I don't think I've mentioned yet, but, um, well, let me, Speaking of stereo cockpit, I'll focus on flying here. So I'm seeing airspeed's alive, good. Coming up to 50, there's 55, rotate. And establish our VY attitude. Let the plane accelerate, right rudder for left turning tendencies. Okay, as we cross the end of the runway, I'm turning 10 degrees to the right. I forgot to bug in my... Okay, 200 feet, bring up my flaps, and so I have zero degrees of flaps, and I'm still using some right rudder to keep myself uh, to avoid those left-wing tendencies. Looking for traffic around, make sure there's no one else. Also checking my angle relative to the horizon, so we're flying at an attitude and then confirming the airspeed, um, not flying at airspeed. I mean, you know, attitude flying first, right? So 90% of our attention is outside the plane. Okay, looking for air traffic that might be ahead or around us. Looks like we got a pretty clear day here today. And so I'm gonna actually start my crosswind turn here. 50 before 800, our traffic pattern altitude. So I'll bring this back to 2000, level off at 800. Again, looking for traffic in the direction I'm turning. Looking for traffic that might be entering on the 45 from over, there's Coyote Hills over there. Um, oops, I put it over 
turn. Yep. So overturned a little bit. And now I'm going to turn on to base leg. Watching my runway. I want to be paralleling my runway. Good. And I can confirm that I'm parallel. Uh, the best way is looking out the window. Um, just fly based on what you're really seeing. Um, you can also double check on your heading indicator there. So I see that 3-1 is facing directly behind me. That's good. I'm also lined up with that building right ahead that I, I like to use as a reference. So that's good. Uh, 2,000 RPM still. Everything looks good. Engine instruments are all good. Now we're going a little slow here. So we're at 75 knots and I would expect us to be at 90 knots for this. Um, it's also going a little bit to the left. Make sure I'm watching my heading here. And I have picked out that building that you can see right, it sort of looks like a weird triangle blob thing there. Um, that's what I'm flying towards. That's what I'm using for my, my reference for distance. Okay. As we cross the threshold here, so gumps check before, which would have been gas, undercarriage welded, brakes, mixture is rich, uh, prop fixed, switches are good, seatbelts on. Um, I'm a little late then coming in for my, because uh, I want to beam the threshold, I want to bring it to 1500 and let the airplane start descending at 80 knots. So there's 1500. And. We're looking to turn onto base when we get to a 45. So there's about a 45. So the runway is halfway between our wing and our fuselage. So now the airspeed I'm looking for is 70. I want 20, knot, 20 degrees of flaps. And I'm looking for traffic, uh, especially coming in on uh, final here because if someone was coming in on a long straight in, they'd be coming in from over there. I'm gonna make sure there's no one be conflicting with me here that collision avoidance I've got 65 knots here so I'll round up for my nice good base now it looks like I'm a little low um, and so I'm actually going to bring in a little bit more power to hold my altitude here so the way that we correct for that kind of thing on base is we'll add more power to keep the same airspeed but then just hold our altitude okay rolling into final again looking for traffic use 30 degree banks is just fine in the traffic pattern so I'm seeing red over red which is a little low I need my flaps to 30 there's my white over red that's what I'm looking for and 65 for my airspeed so let's see so I'm trimming for that attitude I got 1500 rpm still a little bit slow on the airspeed so I'm gonna uh, nose down right pitch for airspeed power for altitude okay so now we have red over red uh, oh, I'm using the wrong aiming point. So I'm aiming for the threshold, but I'm going to actually aim for the uh, where the glide slope indicator is. So nose down a little bit more, my airspeed. So that's just at the just a beam the um, pole there. All right, I'm actually going to go around, go around. So full power, flaps 20. Let the airplane accelerate above the runway. Okay, right rudder for left turning tendencies. As I get positive rate of climb at VY, I'll bring up flaps to 10 and flaps to 20. Okay, so the reason I went around there is that was a salvageable landing for sure. Um, I didn't like that I had come in and I had not picked an aiming point um, by the time I was already coming into final. So I was sort of, you could tell that I I was expecting to see the glide path indicators be white over red, but then I was using an aiming point that was before the glide path indicator, which means that as I got low, it would be red over red. So I want to demonstrate coming in right on the glide path uh, correctly. So we're going around here. Um, and it's a good reminder that any landing can be a go around. So looking under my right wing before I turn, got 50 before 800, so I'm gonna bring my power to 2000. Looking for traffic in the direction I'm turning for other traffic and during the pattern, especially from Coyote Hills over on the 45 over there. It's a little low on my RPA. Roll out at 90 degrees. That looks a little cleaner. Okay. And roll into my downwind. Initiate the turn with coordinated rudder and aileron. And I can use about 30 degrees. So I'm looking for the runway there. 
good. Okay. So the nose is kind of swinging a little bit. Oops. So I've got a little low on my altitude. And so what I'm going to do here is uh, add some power, climb back up to uh, 800 feet AGL, get back to my traffic pattern altitude. Make sure I'm nice and set up for a proper pattern. Okay, 800, bring it back to 2000. Do my gums check on the downwind gas? Good, got plenty of gas left. Undercarriage welded and brakes seem to work. Mixture is rich. Uh, prop is fixed and switches good and seat belts all on. Okay, great. So now we're waiting till we're a beam the threshold here. Now my runway is about halfway up my strut there. You can see in the distance. That's good. That's about the distance I want. So now we're beam the threshold. So I'm bringing in 1500 RPM and it's a little low on the RPM and 10 degrees of flaps, letting the plane uh, descend at about 80 knots. Wait till I'm at my 45 here. Little slow on the airspeed, so my trim is off a bit. I'm gonna start my turn into the right here, looking for traffic as I turn, make sure that I'm not turning into anyone. Now I'm looking for 70 knots on base, 20 degree uh, flaps. And I'm finding that I'm consistently coming in a little low, and I think it's because I'm descending a little fast. So I'm actually gonna use 1600 RPM instead. Um, that may be just the way the sim is calibrated. It may be actually that this aircraft 1600 would work better on a perfectly clear day. Um, there could be a lot of reasons. So we're a little slow here, so I want to get to 70 knots, so I'll bring my nose down. We're going to hit our precise airspeeds. Looking for traffic on final, looking good. We'll roll into final here. Now we're looking for 65 knots, full flaps, 1600 RPM. And my aiming target is a beam, the glide slope indicator. So there's my 65 knots, I'm nice and trimmed out. And oops, uh, my trim is off a little bit, there we go. Okay, great, getting aligned with center line here. And if it's set up correctly, the airplane should fly itself down to the runway. So a little low, you can tell my glide path is coming when I'm below the glide path there. Um, but we can do this as a landing, so we'll come in uh, 65 knots, and I'm going to use the top of the piano keys as my aiming point. As I come to the aiming point, now I'm changing my what I'm looking at. Power's at idle, and I'm looking off to the end of the runway to hold off. So I'm just holding off the runway, holding off, holding off. No. There we go. And now I'm using my rudder to stay aligned with the center line, and I'm uh, letting the airplane slow down naturally. So I'm not using any brakes here. As we get to the end of the runway then, we may use some to kind of slow down a little. Okay, great. So there's one landing. I'll stay aligned with my yellow taxiway. The other thing to keep in mind, so there's no crosswind right now, but the other thing to keep in mind is when we're uh, taxiing free of the runway, we shouldn't do any cleanup unless you're doing a specific procedure, uh, but we don't want to do any cleanup until we're free of the uh, runway so okay so now we're here bring my power to uh, 11,000 flaps to oh I'm sorry we'll do our cleanup flow starting from a flow so we do a trim set for takeoff um, mixture for taxi flaps to uh, 10 degrees and then our lights as necessary which for us will be turn off the lighting okay I'm gonna take a quick peek see if there are any questions in the chat otherwise we'll go for another round here um, and this is sort of the rough plan for today is to keep doing uh, laps like this. And I'll try and talk through um, what I'm doing for each one. Um, let's see if there's any questions. Okay, great. Oh, I can look at my, oh, that's okay. So got about a 0.8 mile uh, with some nice clean base legs, a little bit sloppy on the crosswind. Um, so look at that. Okay. so. As I'm landing, there's a technique that I would strongly encourage you to practice, and, and I do this uh, real flying and sim flying, uh, VR flying, I think it's a really good idea. And it's about where you look on the runway as you're landing. 
So as you're coming in, before you start your round out, you're looking at your aiming point and watching that aiming point grow in your windshield. As you reach the threshold, as you're starting your round out, you want to level off by looking at the center, uh, the midpoint of the runway. So down the runway a little ways, um, but not all the way to the end of the runway, just about halfway down. Um, and that's how you can uh, level off to just above the runway. And then as you're holding the aircraft off at the end, you should look at the end of the runway, sort of um, all the way down. And that lets you see that lets you judge your distance better um, above the runway and actually hold the aircraft off until you fully land it. So you heard me trying to call those out as I was uh, flying it. Um, I'll try and call them out again when I'm switching between each of those, uh, but that's the three different places I'm looking. So it's aiming point, growing in the windshield the entire way, and then the midfield of the runway, and then the uh, end of the runway as you're holding the airplane off. All right, let's go back. So uh, on ground or on this taxi, we'd probably say something like, I'd like to taxi back to runway 31. Palo Alto Tower would probably say something like, taxi back each time on Zulu. Um, you know, I advise on termination and say taxi back 31 each time on Zulu, advise termination. Uh, okay, so we're good to go. So now we're taxiing around. We may have other aircraft also in the pattern, especially at Palo Alto, it's really busy. And there's often other people landing. Um, and so being cognizant of if they're gonna maybe pull out of that uh, taxiway from the runway or something like that, it's good, good to know. Uh, you may wanna uh, uh, stop and let them by, uh, or sometimes the tower will give you specific instructions to those hold bars that we are cognizant of. Looks like I'm taxiing a little fast. We want to be taxiing about uh, walking speed, so it should be really uh, pretty pretty chill taxiing. I'm going to do this takeoff for left pa traffic pattern, which also means we'll use a uh, traffic pattern altitude of 1,000 feet. So we talked about this yesterday at Palo Alto. It's left track because a thousand feet when you're over the, the houses and uh, right traffic from runway 31 over the bay is 800 feet. Um, so we'll do left traffic pattern. That's also the more typical one altitude, but also direction. So our standard traffic pattern direction is left traffic. Um, so we can kind of see what that looks like. And then Palo Alto has a four degree glide slope. So it's a little steeper descent angle than a standard runway. Standard runway, you have a three degree glide slope. Um, so here I am stopping now clear of, or uh, short of the hold short lines. One thing that I am aware of and I have asked about in the past is, you know, we talked about runway incursions and you're not allowed to have your wings cross that threshold. Well, I'm looking out the window and my wing is across that line. And the response I, I got and I think is the right take on it is, you are currently on the yellow line. Well, I'm a little bit to the right, so I should be uh, more to the left, but you are on the yellow line taxiing for takeoff and you haven't started to turn onto the runway. So I'm just sitting here straight and uh, really what I'd be doing, by the way, is looking for traffic um, before I get cleared. So I wanna make sure that there's no one uh, you know, either in left traffic or right traffic. Also listening on the radio for calls that are being made so I know who's coming. Uh, but so I'm sitting here straight. I haven't yet started turning out of the taxiway, and so the wing over on the left is uh, probably fine. This is a design of the airport thing. If I did pull up and started maybe turned 45 degrees, then we start to get into runway incursion area. So that would be a, a no no. Oops. Uh, I left my RPM at 1,000. Uh, you may have heard that on the audio. That's a, a good one that uh, you can usually hear wrong. Okay, so Tower would say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, clear takeoff, runway 31, left close traffic. And then we'd say clear takeoff 31, clear for takeoff 31, left close traffic, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. Before we cross, we go lights, camera, action. So lights, camera's good, action. We have 10 degrees of flaps. Uh, sorry, we have our, our uh, trim set, mixture rich, 10 degrees of flaps, and then we'll bring the power as we go. Taxiing a little fast. Approaching there. runway 31. 
Alright, so I'm moving through traffic. Uh, coming in, make sure, remaining. even though they've cleared me for taxi, I still want to make sure that I'm visually scanning, seeing avoid uh, other traffic. Stay on this yellow line. Clearing the traffic pattern. Okay, looking good. All right, and then remember this is a relocated threshold, so if these were white chevrons instead, we could actually be taking off from this area, but we'll start our takeoff here. Bring in full power over four seconds, two, three, four, okay. And stay aligned with the center line. Good, airspeed's alive, good. And we get to 55. Rotate for takeoff, pitch for VY, plane accelerate. Good. We're at VY. Once we get to 200 feet, then we will bring in or remove our flaps. So now we're at flap zero. Something else you can't see that I'm doing, but is a very good habit to be in. I've deviated 10 degrees off to the right for noise abatement. Um, one thing you can't see but is a good habit to be in is the I'm holding the throttle too, so I'm guarding the throttle to make sure it doesn't work its way backwards. Um, sometimes just the vibrations of the plane can kind of make the throttle come back, and if you aren't guarding it, you may lose that power without really All right, so we're going for left traffic, so I'm looking for traffic over here. We'll start off to the left. Um, I typically wait till about 700 feet before I turn crosswind. Um, technically, uh, well, technically you could wait till only 400 or so, but I think 700 is a really good. Oops, I forgot that it's 1,000 feet on this side. So keep climbing here. Good, looking for traffic. Same thing, I want to make sure there's no one just screaming along here. Roll out for a nice crosswind. As we get to 1,000, I'm bringing the power back to 2,000. traffic and now I'm going to roll into my downwind leg the traffic around the wing make sure there's no one out there good okay and I'm aiming for my downwind leg to line up with 101 this is the highway here um, which is looking pretty good now it's not quite parallel to the runway so we just use it as a general reference but it's, um, it's an okay reference point okay good Roll out there. I feel my control pressures are off a little bit. So I'm a little low on uh, altitude. I like to be at uh, 1,000. We want to fly to the numbers as um, uh, always hitting our, our air speeds and altitudes um, uh, precisely. So you know it's best to not be off at all. Although there's a little bit of a margin of tolerance for the check ride, we want to be flying precisely all the time. So there we go, there's 1,000. Um, looking at my space in the runway, looks good. Do my gumps check, gas, good. Undercarriage welded, and brakes seem to work. Mixture is rich. Uh, prop is fixed. And then switches, all the lights are on, and seatbelts, okay, good. Okay. Now my runway spacing is halfway up the strut. That looks good, it looks like I'm a little, uh, maybe I'm parallel to it, okay. As we get a beam, the threshold here, so I'm bringing the power back. I'm sorry, not all the way back, power to 1500 and then flaps to 10. Let the nose come down and we'll fly at 80 knots for this leg. Good. So from 1000 feet, it's a little easier. Uh, you have a little bit more altitude to work with. I don't know that it's necessarily easier, it's just a little... The pattern that, you know, uh, I've done a thousand times, I guess is how you'd say it. So. Um, okay, we're coming up on... 45 there, so that looks pretty good. Let's turn on to base. And so turning base, I'm looking for traffic in the direction I'm turning, looking for traffic uh, that might be coming down on final. Good, 70 knots of my airspeed, good. And trimming to make sure that I'm holding that airspeed. I'm gonna use 1600 again here, I think. Uh, that may be that that's what I end up using going forward. I think that works a little bit better. And I can be pitching, or I'm sorry, banking a little bit more aggressively here. We can uh, maybe do that. Okay, great. And then rolling into final, again, looking for traffic coming in on final. 
looking for 65 knots airspeed, 1600 RPM, and full flaps. Okay, so I've overshot final a little bit here. We can go back and correct from that, all right. Um, so again, we wanna go to this center line, make sure our airspeed is staying at 65. So I have it trimmed up for 65, so I'm being cognizant to not um, pull back on the elevator too much because the airplane will continue flying at the airspeed I've set. So instead what I'm doing is I'm increasing my power. Okay, there we go. Oops, lost a little bit of airspeed. So again, pitch for airspeed, good. And I'm flying to the glide path, uh, a beam the glide path is my aiming point. So I'm watching that grow in size of my windshield and adjusting power as necessary to, to fix that glide path. I'm a little slow on my indicated airspeed. I really want to be at 65. Pitch for nose, or nose, uh, pitch for airspeed, power for altitude. Okay, good. Seeing the point, I'm using the beginning of the second runway stripe as the specific spot I'm looking at. Checking my airspeed a little low, bringing power back as we start the round out. And holding off, looking at the end of the runway. Oops. And there you go. Okay. Great. So then this is again where we can pull back on the yoke to aerodynamic braking and so when I do that essentially what I'm doing is kind of putting the elevator into the wind uh, and kind of slowing myself down even more and also forcing the um, the wings at a, a bit of an angle of attack which creates that induced drag so that'll also increase our drag. All right um, some things that went well I thought my airspeed during the majority of the pattern was pretty good during the final approach it got a little low um, I would like 65 instead, um, and I think I do think 1600 RPM is a better RPM setting to use for this, and so I'm going to try that throughout the entire descent. Um, I'll go from there. So okay, it's actually going to here. Quick time check. Okay, I like they have a clock in the airplane. That's useful. So I said we'd go for another 30 minutes more. I think that that's still uh, appropriate. Um, I also want to do a little bit of crosswind takeoffs and landings. So why don't we do, let me double check real quick in the chat, make sure there's more questions. Okay, great. Sounds good. So what I'm going to do is let's stop here. We'll do our cleanup flow. So every time we stop, power to a thousand. Set our trim for takeoff, mixture for taxi, and our flaps to 10 for takeoff and our lights until we go and take off. Okay, and then taxi back. Oh, someone's flying out here. Hello there, friend. Quality on this is pretty low. Uh, what else about that last lap? So altitude to 1,000 um, for our inland pattern altitude. Um, I suspect my legs on there were pretty crisp, except I overshot the turn to final. Um, and there's two things that I think went poorly there. One is I should have started my turn to final. It went a little slow for taxi. Let's go a little faster. Um, overshot my turn to final. Um, simply from not rolling into the turn to final early enough. Um, there's another element going on, which is not turning, uh, not banking through each of the turns of my pattern as steeply as I could have. So I, I am actually in the habit of doing 20 degree banks and I wish that I had learned at 30 degree banks instead. I think that's a more standard bank angle to use in the pattern. It also gives you less time spent turning and more time spent on each of the legs. So I'm going to be focused on that for the next time around, is really trying to use 30 degree banks for each of the pattern laps. Uh, I'm a big fan of choosing specific things to work on each time you go out and practice. Um, and sometimes you have to fly one to see what it is you want to work on, but, um, but I think that's a really good habit to be in. So my focus for this next one is going to be uh, 30 degree banks through each of the laps. Uh, and then of course the landing is our so we'll plan to do one more landing before we get some crosswind going, and I'll uh, demonstrate the crosswind landings. 
and uh, yeah, we can go from there. Oh, the other thing that I'm doing that I, I, uh, I'm working on being better about is you'll know that I mentioned when we land. Okay, let me make sure there's no aircraft there. When we land, we want to make sure that there is um, that we when we pull our yoke back. We kind of lock it in so like we get to this uh, pitch attitude we're going to hold it here and then we get to this pitch attitude and hold it here hold it here hold it here um at some point i started doing this kind of like back and forth thing to try and get the pitch that i want um, and that's a bad habit so this is another thing that i'm working on um, which is you know lock it in and don't let the yoke come further forward pull it back lock it in don't let it come further forward and you want the plane to settle on the runway at the correct pitch attitude um, not changing pitch attitude through the flare, or not forward back on the pitch attitude through the flare. So, all right, so we're stopped here. Uh, as soon as we stop, we're gonna bring the power to a thousand. Tower says something like, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango NDC here, clear for takeoff, three one, right close traffic. I'm saying something back. Clear for takeoff, three one, cl left close, or er, right close, yeah, we'll do right close traffic. Cessna Alpha Lima Tango NDC here, lights, camera, action. So lights first, camera is good, action. Uh, Trim is set, mixture rich, flaps 10, and we are good to go. Start rolling out here. I'll mention this because this is a good time. Again, I'm looking for Entered traffic runway on 31. 2,600 feet remaining. I want to make sure it's clear, especially if you another guy. Hey, friend, uh, flying around here with us. Um, so we're looking for traffic all around. I'll mention this because this is a time when uh, a student would be likely to be on both the power and the brakes. You don't want to have power in when you're using the brakes. So before we get on the brakes, we remove the power. Um, same sort of thing we were talking about earlier with the aerodynamic braking, just preserve the brake pads. Um, no reason to be adding thrust when you're trying to um, slow down. It just doesn't, doesn't work for that. All right, uh, takeoff. So we're bringing in power, of course, for four seconds, uh, not three seconds. So we'll go one, two, three. Okay, good. Our plane will start to accelerate. No wind on this beautiful day. Airspeed's alive, holding the center line, a little bit more right rudder. Increasingly more as the airplane accelerates. And I know I'll need more as I rotate. Rotate at 55. Stay aligned with the center line. Holding my VY pitch attitude, letting the plane accelerate. Good. Okay, there's 74 or VY. And as we get to 2,000 or 200 feet, then we're going to bring in uh, remove flaps, excuse me. And uh, as I cross the end of the runway, I deviate off uh, for noise abatement. So attitude's a little bit off here. So let's see what's going on. Looking for traffic in the pattern. I'd be listening on the radio already through this whole thing to make sure that there's no one coming in. My sight picture here looks okay, but my airspeed is a little better than I expected. So I'm gonna adjust my pitch to that airspeed. Okay, I'm gonna start turning right crosswind here. That's at 800, so we'll bring power to 2000. Apply the pattern at 800. Looking for traffic as we're turning around here. Good, again, looking for traffic coming in. And apply a nice crosswind leg here. Angled in a little bit far, so I overturned there just a bit. And I'm turning into my uh, downwind leg. So again, I'm working on doing 30 degree banks in the pattern, so that's good. There's my 33s. Okay. And rolling out on my parallel to the runway. Okay, good. I got my ground reference ahead for uh, the direction I want to be pointing. Uh, seems like I'm maybe a little bit, is my compass processing? I think it is. I have lost a little bit of altitude there, so I'm going to bring in power, climb back up to 800, make sure I get back to my pattern altitude, and then bring this to 2000 again. Uh, keep flying through the pattern here. Good. Do a gumps check. So I'm looking parallel on the runway. Gas under gash is good. Undercarriage welded and brakes seem to work. Mixture rich. Prop 
fixed. Switches and seatbelts, good, okay. Climbing a little bit there. I got a little bit too much uh, throttle in. There's 2,000, okay, good. We're at 90 knots though, so that's kind of what we're looking for for her speed. Okay, across the threshold, um, we're gonna bring power to 1,500 and flaps to 10. Let the airplane start to descend at 80 knots. I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a uh, earlier turn in this time because I think I'm coming in too low for base. So um, when we get to about 600, 650, I'm gonna roll in to the right and looking for traffic in the direction I'm turning. And I wanna get 70 air or 70 knots uh, airspeed here, 1600 RPM, 20 degrees of flaps. And oops, 30 degree bank for all my turns. It's my practice area, good. So there's my 70 knots, 90 degrees to the runway, looking good, looking for traffic coming down final or in the opposite direction. So 70 knots and 1600 RPM. Feels like I'm a little low. Um, so I'm gonna put in a little bit more power. That's just a judgment call. And then I'm gonna start rolling into final. There's 30 degrees bank. Again, looking for traffic on final and full flaps. And I'm looking for 65 knots. So the airplane come to 65. I have red over red, so I want to hold this altitude until I'm back on the glide slope. So I'm applying power and then maintaining this altitude and airspeed. There we go, there's glide slope, 65 coming in, 1600 RPM. A little slow on my airspeed, so I'm gonna let the nose uh, down. Yep, I wanna stay on that glide slope all the way through. There we go, good. Now, if you were using the threshold as your aiming point instead of the start of the second um, runway stripe, then you would lose your white over red as you're coming in, so. Okay, so it should be white over red the whole way because of where we're aiming. Bringing out power as we come in, looking at the middle of the runway to level off, and then holding the airplane off by looking at the end of the runway, locking in each of these different settings as we go, and letting the nose wheel touch down on the runway. Okay, great. Use our brakes and pull back on the elevator, use some aerodynamic braking. Okay, great. So I hope that was sort of useful. Um, uh, takeoffs and landings both, but uh, landings especially are one of those things that um, working with your own CFI in the real world, they will correct specifically what they're seeing from your landings. And that's a really useful and important uh, piece of feedback to improve your landings. So um, this would be one, if you're, um, this would be one I would be cautious about practicing too much in the sim without direct feedback. It's sort of one of those things that you don't want to be uh, learning wrong and then and then readjusting. So I will put the big disclaimer on everything we're talking about today. Probably should have led the lesson with it actually. Um, the principles and the ideas are all definitely um, uh, use them as you'd like sort of thing, but the in practice going and doing these landings, um, you wanna have that, that feedback every time you go in and do a landing of, okay, here's specifically what uh, the instructor was seeing and what their recommendation would be. All right, so as soon as we stop, power to 11,000, 11,000, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> 1,000 RPM, power to 1,000 RPM as soon as we stop. Uh, we'll do our cleanup flow, so reset our trim, mixture for taxi, and flaps to 10 degrees, good. And lights, Get our landing light. All right, I'm going to pop out of my VR setup here. One, I'll check the chat for any questions, but then also I will change the weather and I'm gonna give us a little bit of a crosswind here. So give me a moment while I'm changing around what we're doing. All right, not seeing any questions, so. Um, here is how I'm going to do this. I'm going to flip back to the iPad. Uh, and notebook. Leave VR. 
All right, so we know that our runway heading is 310. So if we wanted to, actually I can do this. Might as well show what I'm doing here. So if we wanted to have a crosswind, and what I'm looking for is an eight knot crosswind. And I want to have, um, well, I want to have an eight knot crosswind. So, okay. My OBS streaming just sort of uh, glitched out on me a little bit. So hopefully it didn't come through. Um, so I want an eight knot crosswind. So I can do that by just setting eight knots at 90 degrees to um, what we're seeing. That would be one way of doing this and that would work just fine. Um, but let's be a little more interesting, right? So we know that if it's 30 degrees off from the runway heading, we know that that means that we're going to have half of the um, uh, speed is going to be in the crosswind component. So runway heading is 310. So if we set our wind to 280, um, I assume these are magnetic headings. Uh, if anyone knows for the sim, that would be useful to know. Actually, let me jot that down. All right, so we know that if it's 30 degrees off, half of the wind speed will go to uh, crosswind. And so I can bring this speed up to uh, 16 knots. Oops, not too much. 16 knots. And now we have, uh, when we're on takeoff and landing, we'll have half of our wind will be crosswind. And um, essentially, the whole of the wind will be downwind. So we'll actually get a uh, better landing performance because we have a bit of a, a headwind. Um, okay, so then I don't want to have gusts in a different direction. That's how we get uh, potentially wind shearing. Uh, we also don't want gusts of different strength. So I'm just going to bring this to no gusts. And I hope that that gives me the wind I'm looking for. Okay, great. So 280 at 16. That means that we're going to have um, wind from the left and we're gonna have eight knots of crosswind so you talk through our takeoffs and our landings there all right i'm going to step back up for vr here uh great time for questions if anyone has any for the chat otherwise i will hop in on just a moment All right, back into VR we go. That's exciting. Let's see if we can reset this. Okay, great. So let me get my site picture correct again. Set here, okay, good. So it's still a little low. Okay, so I can see just over the cowl, good. Good, this feels about right. Um, so now we have wind coming from 280. Uh, we've also had some precessing of our heading indicator. This does happen in real planes, so this is a good one to just go and reset. So you'll notice that our magnetic compass is different than our heading indicator. Because it's a gyroscope, it will precess over time, especially um, in maneuvers with turns like what we're doing. And so I'm resetting this then just to match the heading indicator. I'm also going to bug up our uh, 310 runway because that's a good habit to be in. So that's our takeoff runway. Now, our wind is coming from 280. That's on this side of the heading indicator. And so, make sure I switched over. Okay, okay good. Um, so that's coming from our uh, right tailwind. And so, we want to have our uh, ailerons deflected as though we're diving away from the wind and our ailerons pushed forward, uh, actually diving away from it. All right, and let's get taxiing here. Got the parking brake on, so take the parking brake off and get going. There you go, you can feel that wind as we're trying to taxi. So it's interesting, I can feel the wind trying to push my, oops, I'm going way too fast here. I can feel the wind trying to push my uh, uh, empennage 
uh, into the wind. So I'm getting this kind of, I have to use a lot of left, uh, left rudder and a little bit of left brake even just to taxi through here. Um, we do have a 16 knot wind is a pretty strong um, surface wind. Um, definitely, uh, definitely within uh, flyable, um, but it's strong enough that you would see some of these kinds of effects. That would be another reason why if we had done just eight knots direct crosswind, we wouldn't have quite so strong a total wind that we're looking at. Yeah, looking for other aircraft coming in. Um, See our glide slope indication is right there. So, so that's where the red and the white symbols come from while we're landing. And we don't need gust factors, so we don't need to account for gust. Oops, I need to hold this forward. We don't need uh, to account for gust in our um, landings, so that's kind of nice. If we did have uh, gust, we would add that one half of the gust factor to our landings. Uh, so let's say we're taxiing along in Palo Alto Towers, uh, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango in New Sierra, clear for takeoff 3 1, right close traffic. Let's say we're going to take off 3 1, right close traffic. Um, before we cross the threshold, we do lights, camera, action. So I'm still holding my wind correction. Uh, and lights, camera's good, action, mixture rich. Our trim is set. So it's trim, mixture, uh, flaps 10, and Bring in power our throttle so let's get rolling again and i'm looking in the traffic pattern i want to see that no one's coming in on final it's got going a little fast approaching there. runway three as i enter runway three one through the wind 2, need to rotate my feet remaining uh, to continue to adjust for the wind and then as we turn back through now to a headwind i don't need that forward pressure on the elevator but i do need to deflect my a reminder that that windsock is in reverse, so the wind's actually coming from our it's a headwind from the front. That shows it uh, a headwind from the left. That shows it as a tailwind from the right. That is 180 degrees off, so um, don't fall for it. Just a bug in the the add-on. Um, but if you caught that while you were taxiing, and that's really good, you should be checking for wind indicators when you're taking off. Um, so all right. So same sort of thing we do with takeoff. So we're going to bring in power over the course of four seconds, two, three, four, using right rudder to keep aligned with the center line. And we're trying to feel out how much wind correction we need as we go. So I'm just trying to find the right amount here. Airspeed's alive. So we're expecting to roll up onto one wheel, but probably only for a moment here. Airspeed's alive. And there's our takeoff. OK. We establish a crab right away. So we want to stay aligned with the center line, which means we need to be flying out uh, at an angle to the wind. So it'll probably be maybe like this. Um, I'm a little faster than my VY, so I can give him a little bit of uh, power. Now, one thing to notice, I'm still flying coordinated, right? So uh, 200 feet, we'll bring in uh, uh, flaps, so or, uh, uh, go no flaps. I'm still flying coordinated, and I'm also still deviating for the um, noise abatement. So because I have a wind coming from my left, it's blowing me to the right, and so I don't need to turn as much because my ground track is already going to be correct noise abatement. A little bit of waves in the water now. It's kind of fun. Looking into my right wing for traffic, checking for traffic out ahead. I've got a little bit more airspeed here than I want. I should be climbing out of view well. Um, as we get to 800 AGL, bringing my power back to 2,000, and rolling onto my crosswind here. Need a little more altitude than I wanted. The other thing that I'm thinking about is I have a uh, wind coming from my back left, so I need to have a crab angle that's a little bit to the uh, uh, left. So my angle, I remember I'm crabbing into the wind as I'm flying through this. And we have a, an angled wind, so we actually need to be accounting for that. Um, each of our turns. So uh, 2,000 RPM, 800 feet, looking for traffic coming into the pattern. And our wind is coming from 280, so I need to crab a little bit to the right. So my ground track is parallel with the airport, uh, even though my nose isn't quite, probably a little bit too far crabbed in. Um, so maybe like here is good. But you'll notice that although my heading indicator, I'm no longer aligned 
heading wise with the airport oh my airspeed is really low here so that's a little bit concerning so i'm at 70 knots and i'm expecting 90 here so all right gums check gas under carriage mixture prop switches as we come a beam the threshold here powered at 1500 and 10 degrees of flaps let the airplane start to come down at 80 knots now the wind is going to blow me downwind so this is going to make it very easy to accidentally have too long a base leg I'm sorry too long a downwind leg so I'm looking at my window trying to gauge this and I want 80 knots not oh I have not enough RPM it's a good example where that sound would be really helpful 1600 I should just see if I can fix that actually I've tried quite a bit I don't I don't think I can fix it um, all right so I am turning off to the right here now I'm looking for 70 knots and just like our ground uh, reference maneuvers, uh, 70 knots, 20 degrees of flaps. And just like our ground reference maneuvers, as we're, oh, and I want to do 30 degree banks. When we're coming out on, um, uh, we need to be crabbed into the wind a little bit to fly our ground track. Probably over crabbed here a little bit. Um, and I'm looking for 70 knots, so I'm going to put my nose down. Now I've got quite a bit of power in because. I'm feeling a little low looking at what I'm seeing for the runway here. Um, so I'm trying to get my, hold my altitude at 500 here while I uh, stabilize for this final approach. Okay, and you can see, it's interesting actually, you can look ahead and you can see that I'm moving that direction even though my nose is pointing that direction. So that's a skill to be developing too, is you can see your relative motion by what all right, we got white over white, which means we're a little bit high. Um, go back to 1600, and we can now roll into final. I want 65 knots, and 16 degrees RPM. Again, looking for traffic coming in on final. Good, good, okay. And there's 65 knots, and I want a little bit more airspeed, or I'm sorry, a little bit more throttle. Good. Now I'm expecting to need to crab into the wind to maintain center line, so pitch for airspeed, power for altitude. There's my airspeed I'm looking for. And I have the aircraft trimmed up for that, so that's good. Okay, and I'm using that same second landing stripe as my um, target. Now you can see I'm crabbing into the wind here, so it's that same technique we talked about for takeoffs. We talked about it for landings as well. Crabbing into the wind to maintain center line and flying towards that point. White over red, good. Airspeed's getting a little slow, getting a little low, so power for altitude, pitch, pitch for airspeed, power for altitude, good. As we get to about this point, you can transition to a side slip, so we put our uh, wing into the wind to hold us aligned with center line. Bring in power to idle as we go into the round out and flare. You know, we wanna be nose aligned, so I'm using left aileron, right rudder, touch down on the left wheel first. All right, uh, not my greatest approach to landing ever. Um, I actually do want to do, how are we going to, I only have about five minutes left. So let's do something uh, kind of as a good demonstration. Oh, I forgot the taxi part of it. So the other thing is that of course now, now that we're taxiing, we're increasing our use of uh, aileron for wind deflection. So this is a, an important thing and something that uh, can really get you in trouble. Uh, if you noticed I was fighting against the airplane to just try and keep on the center line, a lot of it was because I didn't have that uh, aileron deflection. So as we come through the wind, then wind's now a, a headwind from the right side. And so we use our left aileron and then from the oop, get clear of this. I don't want to stay behind for the guy coming in after me. Okay, and then uh, for the quartering tailwind, I need uh, left aileron and Okay, um, let's do, let's do this. Let's, we'll fly another traffic pattern around. So let's do our cleanup. So first of all, power to a thousand every time we stop. Uh, and we do our trim for takeoff, mixture for taxi, flaps to 10 degrees. Okay, good. And let's start taxi back. 
So I'm gonna taxi back to the start of the runway. We're gonna do another lap around the pattern. Um, we're gonna do another crosswind landing. And um, a little fast there. No, I don't like that I'm not aligned with the yellow line, but I am out of authority. I guess I could use a little bit of left break would allow me to pivot then too. But uh, Okay, there we go. So I'll get back aligned to that yellow line. So we're gonna do another lap around, but this time instead of doing a crab most of the way in, we're actually gonna do a side slip most of the way in. Um, there is something to be said for practicing the side slip from a little higher up and that it gives you time to really feel out how it works. Um, so we're actually gonna establish a side slip as we turn on to final and use that the whole way down. The reason to not do side slip from that high is then you're flying cross control. So we need, and I'll try and point that out while I'm flying too. But in order to maintain center line, right, we use our rudder to keep the nose pointed down the center line and we use ailerons um, to deflect uh, into the wind to keep the, so the nose pointed towards the center of the runway or like aligned with the runway is with the rudder, but then keeping our airplane flying over the center line is with the ailerons. And so you end up where you're using maybe left aileron and right rudder as we'll do in our case. Um, and of course that cross controlled situation is where we end up with a risk of a spin if we had a stall. So it's sort of a Something you need to practice diligently because it's a skill you need to use, but also an area to be aware that there's a potential problem. So, all right, uh, I'll say where that we're clear for takeoff. The lights, camera, action. Lights, camera looks good, and action. So we'll bring uh, trim, mixture, flaps are set for 10, and our ailerons are still forward here. Looking for traffic in the pattern as we go around. And, oops. <laughs> That is awesome. Thank you, Hoppy. All right, sorry about that. Uh, one of those variables you don't have with uh, real flying is package delivery with the dog. Um, okay, so uh, we'll pick up where we left off. So lights, camera, action before we cross this, and time. So that's uh, 11, time 18.30 doesn't make sense. Um, okay, oops, I, got my, I forgot to have a wind correction angle or aileron deflection for wind. All right, looking for traffic. Stay aligned with the yellow taxi line Approaching runway here. three, and runway three one. 2,600 feet have remaining. The wind from the other side, then we need our ailerons to flip. And as we taxi through, then again, we have the wind coming from the left now, uh, left headwind, and so we'll go this direction. Great. And again, the um, wind sock is incorrect for this runway, so it's 180 degrees flipped. It should be facing the other direction. All right, same sort of thing. Four seconds to power, two, three, four, good. Using my uh, rudder to stay aligned with center line and then slowly decreasing my aileron to find the right amount we need for takeoff. Okay. And there's roll up onto one and uh, rotate at 55 and then we establish a crab into the wind. Okay, there's VY, so we'll hold our attitude for VY. I like to check my attitude relative to the wings too. 200 feet, bring in flaps, still guarding my throttle. All right, and let's say they say something like, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, make left traffic. I'll say left traffic, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. And I'm deviating for the uh, noise abatement, but you'll notice that my noise is not pointed at that uh, brown patch, that building that we use as our reference. Instead, my ground track is that direction, but my nose is still crabbing into the wind. That's weird. Looking out to my left for traffic. 800 feet is an okay altitude to start this turn, so I'm going to roll into the turn here. 50 from 1,000. We're going to bring power back to 2,000. Level our nose to the horizon. 
Okay. Still looking for traffic here. And I'm expecting to use a wind correction angle for this leg because I'm flying into the wind, so angled a little bit upwind. Hopefully that gives me a nice square leg. We'll see in the we'll see in the replay. 2,000 RPM, there we go. Everything else looks good. 1,000 feet, no traffic. Okay, turning, rolling into a left turn here. Make sure I'm coordinated through that turn. 30 degrees bank, looking for traffic. Okay, climbed up a little bit there. Okay, and I rolled out too early on that turn. I do need a little bit of uh, correction for wind, but that was uh, way, way too much uh, angle. So let's get back to more correct here. Okay, great. Okay, we got a uh, thousand feet. We'll get to that more precisely. There's 2000 RPM, thousand feet. Now we're at 75 knots, which surprises me. I would expect us to be at a little bit more, uh, more like 90 for this leg. It's okay, we'll do gumps check, gas. Good, undercarriage, welded, and brakes seem to work. Mixture rich. Uh, prop fixed and switch of seatbelts, good. Okay, so we cross the threshold, then we're gonna bring our power to 1500. Uh, flaps to 10. Sorry, I keep overshooting that power. So one thing that you would start to develop in the pattern is an awareness of the, so my crab angle's off because I'm getting blown into the runway. So I'm gonna adjust that a little bit. Um, yeah, you can see actually, so we're traveling in this direction despite my here. Um, you also develop a sense of the sound of certain power settings. You can hear when you're hitting power settings. All right, that's about 45 degrees, so I'm going to roll into my base turn, looking for traffic, especially traffic coming down on final. Looking for 70 knots airspeed, getting pretty close there. I want 1600 RPM. And now we need to turn more than 90 degrees to get to a crab angle for base here. Airspeed than I want. Good. Okay, good. And I'm going to continue turning because I got blown into the uh, runway throughout that entire turn. And also, oh, and then I need 20 degrees flaps for the base leg. Now one mile final, final runway 31. Full flaps for final. So I'm looking for 65 on final. You can see me really getting blown into the traffic pattern here. So my wind correction angle on downwind was incorrect. And that meant that my pattern got shortened, and so my base leg was essentially non existent. Um, so that's exactly the kind of thing that we're uh, practicing to avoid. You don't want to get blown in, you need to use that uh, crab angle. All right, so we said we're going to crab all, or we're going to sidestep all the way down, so let's do that. So we're sort of aligned with the center line now. To establish a side slip, I use the right rudder and left aileron. I need more power here myself flying so I'm gonna bring in some more power I want 65 knots I don't want to get slow when I'm in a side slip like this so let's I'm actually gonna establish back to the crab get my airspeed back because I don't want to be flying that slow this much kind of wind. okay so establish the side slip again 1600 rpm and again what we're doing is using our rudder to keep aligned with the center line and our ailerons for uh, drift left and right of the runway. Getting a little slow again, so bring me more power. Um, this is not the, th this is a little low for what I would prefer, and I'm only at 60 knots. I'd like to be at 65 for this sort of situation. Um, so in the real world, I would go around uh, when I first started this sentence, but uh, for here, I think we can talk through kind of what the landing looks like. So you notice that I'm using this cross control, bringing out power, and I'm holding that, um, cross controlled, so I'm using my rudder to keep a line in the center line. Left wheel touches down first, and then the right wheel. So I didn't like how low I came in over those trees, um, but the actual landing itself I thought was okay. So same sort of thing you do on any landing, you're holding off, oop, go right, there you go. Keep my wind uh, direction for taxi. Okay, good. Running traffic on Zulu, looks good. Once we come through, now we gotta 
quartering tailwind from the right. So we gotta have our deflection like this. Clear of that taxiway, so we'll bring these up. And do our reset flow, so uh, trim for takeoff, mixture for taxi, flaps 10, um, power should be at 1,000 every time we stop. Uh, and also run my finger over the checklist. So I want to confirm that I've done everything on the checklist. One thing I would have noticed then is my lights, which I didn't go anywhere though. Uh, but anything else that's unique to the plane that you might notice there. Um, so like I said, I, well, let's, uh, we can debrief on the iPad actually. So we'll, uh, we'll park here. I don't see the guy coming in behind me. It'd be nice to actually taxi all the way back, but um, I think for the sake of time, let's, uh, let's call it here. And then I'm gonna switch over to my iPad and we'll debrief on the, the last bit of the flight. I do hope it was useful to see me do that uh, side slip landing so that's how you land to make sure that you're not drifting uh, left and right on the runway right we don't want to have any side loading on the gear um, flip back to this good okay i think that'll work all right so we don't have any side loading on the gear and so i thought the actual landing itself was uh pretty good in that I came in, I kept the nose aligned with the center line. We weren't drifting left and right. Touched down on the upwind wheel first. Let the airplane naturally slow as we transfer the weight from the wings to the wheels. Naturally, the downwind, uh, yeah, the downwind wheel will come down, touch, and then the nose wheel will come down and touch. So that part of it I was pretty pleased with. Um, you can see really, really clearly in the ground track, um, there's this, one is I, I had that, um, turning way too early. So I was thinking, you know, oh, I need to have a crab angle, but my crab angle was way too much here. So that was just um, uh, poor judgment around this corner. As we came into here then, I didn't establish enough crab angle. And so you can see the distance that I was flying is about 4,200. And by the end, the distance that I'm flying is 3,500. And so it's getting narrower and narrower. And the crab angle would have been what kept that a nice square leg. To contrast that though, on the uh, right side, I had uh, pretty much exactly what I'm looking for, for a uh, crab angle. And so I had this really clean line on the outside, clean line down here, a little bit of an overshoot here, but um, I don't remember this actually, that, that may have happened, but, um, but regardless, kind of clean, clean turns. I also like that 30 degrees bank that I've been practicing, so showing up well there. But anyway, because we got blown in here, then we had much less time on base and we're getting blown through base anyway because we have wind coming from this way. And so now we're in a position where we just had to continue turning all the way through just to get back to center line. Um, not great. It would have been nice if instead we had come out here, had some nice time on base, and then been able to turn on to final and account for all of that. Um, the only thing about that last landing, it was too low. Um, if I was with a student and they were that low, it would have been go around. I, I mentioned this at the time, but sort of uh, go around as soon as you're getting to that, that sort of level. Um, you can, uh, you know, level out, add power, level out, reestablish glide path and come down. But at that point we were, you know, less than a hundred feet above the ground. We had strong crosswinds. We were trying to do a side slip. That's a, a recipe for uh, problems. Um, of course, in the sim, we have a little bit more leeway to work with, so I felt comfortable continuing the approach, but in the real world, it would have been a go around. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so I hope that's uh, I hope that's useful for landings. We'll do more of these at every lesson, as you can probably imagine. Uh, if you have any questions, now's a great time in the chat. Otherwise, uh, Discord after the fact is always totally fine too. And I will wait just a second for any last questions. Also out of curiosity, who was flying around with me in the pattern? I might be able to find out actually. Um, let me see if I flip back here. Maybe the world will never know. Uh, all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and I will see you tomorrow for 
open up and make sure I'm nearly positive, but spin awareness and spin recovery. This will be a pretty fun lesson. So, All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, you did a couple of landings. Hey, nice. That's awesome, Fovro. Fovox. Fovox. Bye-bye. Thanks for streaming. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining. Thanks for the questions, too. All right. I'll see you all later. Bye.